Oh, okay. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. We are now uh, live uh, in streaming on uh, LinkedIn and YouTube. Let's wait for uh, some participants and we can start in very few minutes. Okay, I think we can uh, start just the introduction of this uh, conference. Uh, other people will connect in few in few minutes, I think. Just let me uh, introduce myself. Uh, I am Mario Caterino, assistant professor at the University of Salerno. And uh, I am honored to be the chair today of this first uh, conference on performance management, the Copperman Conference, which we obviously hope to repeat in the next years also in an offline uh, in an offline mode uh, let me thank all of you for being here and all the uh, participants and the attendees that will be uh, with us a special thank to the keynote uh, speakers uh, and the organizing and the scientific committees and also to the to the presenters that today will show their recent uh, research results. So uh, after this very brief introduction, I can leave the floor, I can give the floor to Professor uh, Marcello Feira from the University of Campania, who will introduce the conference and the main topics and the, some important uh, things on the, on the conference. So please Marcello, uh, share your screen. Yes, thanks, Mario. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to start uh, this conference. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you are my, my image is flashing, but I go directly to the presentation. So uh, just a few words about uh, the conference. Uh, conference Copperman uh, started from an idea of, of, of different uh, uh, Italian universities that are involved in different ways in the performance management, uh, mainly devoted to the issue of the operations management, but not only limited to this, because the performances are a very transversal uh, issue uh, that involve all companies uh, that in, in a way to, to improve their operations, their strategic, uh, their strategic uh, ways, has to, first of all, uh, to measure their performances. Uh, so uh, starting from this uh, assumption, uh, we devoted our attention to some topics that also will be obviously uh, faced during this, this conference. And uh, it's, it's, um, they are all uh, open issues, let me say, uh, for uh, the academics, but not only for the for what I said before, also for uh, the practitioners mainly. Uh, so performance is a measurement and management systems 
uh, key performance indicators, obviously KPI, also related to activity performance indicators. Uh, the relations with the I4.0, but I can say also to the 5.0, the fifth revolution that we are uh, living right now. Um, so, <clears throat> as I said, this, uh, this conference uh, uh, was started from an idea from three different university, Italian university, uh, Rome Tor Vergata, University of Rome, University of Florence, uh, University of Firenze in Italian, and the University of Campania, Luigi Bambitelli. Uh, these three uh, universities uh, focused on, on these, uh, on these uh, topics and uh, uh, wants to try to collect uh, contributions uh, from practitioners and academics uh, devoted to this, uh, this, uh, these uh, issues of improvement and management. We received uh, for the first uh, for the first uh, event of Copperman, uh, we had a very good result in my opinion. Fifty percent of the papers are coming uh, not from Italy. Uh, this is a good point in my opinion. Three from Morocco, two from Brazil, one from Malaysia, and one from India, and seven from Italy, obviously. Um, so we hope to obviously to improve the number of papers from all around the world. Fortunately, the, 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 let me say the, uh, the papers comes from uh, three different uh, uh, continents, uh, Europe, uh, Africa, uh, four, <laughs> Africa uh, and uh, America and Asia. So we are very glad that uh, the, the voice is spreading all around the world. And uh, we work. Uh, we will work very tough uh, to improve uh, these these uh, worldwide uh, worldwide uh, characteristics of this conference in the future. In the future, uh, just a few words about the organization of the conference. Uh, so uh, the conference uh, is totally free. This is a, an important point. We believe. In open science, we believe in open conference and we believe in open knowledge. So we want to share the knowledge. Through LinkedIn, YouTube and, and Twitter, you can uh, uh, go directly live. And so you can attend uh, this conference, not paying anymore. The knowledge has as is important that is shared. Shared knowledge. Knowledge has to be shared. After this, uh, this uh, promotion, uh, uh, we will have uh, two keynote speeches, very, very important speakers uh, for us and uh, for all the performance management world uh, that uh, uh, will have uh, two speeches of 25 minutes each with the plus uh, five minutes of question and answers. 14 papers uh, we received, uh, so 12 minutes each plus three minutes of question and answers. We'll have two breaks, one short break uh, of 15 minutes after the two keynote speech and one long break uh, during the lunch uh, for, for Italy. Uh, so 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, the closure uh, ceremony uh, that uh, in which we will uh, announce the best paper award and the best pre presentation award. Uh, this is uh, the program, so don't uh, don't move. Uh, stay with us, and uh, just a few words about uh, the first uh, uh, keynote uh, speaker that we'll have, Charlotta Johnson, uh, and uh, she's uh, she's a professor at the Department of Automatic Control and the fa at Faculty of Engineering of Lund University. She's dean. Uh, of uh, uh, for campus Alzenborg. I hope that I I had the right pronunciation of the Lund University, and uh, she also is a visiting prof scholar professor so to Zhejiang University in China and the University of California Berkeley. Uh, so um, we are very honored to have her, and uh, obviously also Richard Keegan uh, that will be presented after the, the speech of Charlotta. So thanks everybody for being here once again. 
and uh, I hope to see you next year, like Mario said, uh, offline, we hope. And uh, what say? Thanks. Yes, hello. My name is Charlotta Johnson, and I will be giving a talk about key performance indicators for smart industry. And uh, thank you very much, Marcello, for the introduction. As you said, I work at Lund University, which is in the Scandinavian country in Sweden. And here I am professor at the Department of Automatic Control. And just as you said, also the dean of one of our campuses, the campus in Helsingborg, an excellent pronunciation. In addition to that, I also serve as the chair for one committee within ISO, the International Standardization Organization. And this committee is TC184 SC5. It's a committee that is working with smart industry and industrial interoperability. And we also do some work related to key performance indicators, which I will come to. I added one more figure with an introduction of myself because I think the past couple of years have been so very interesting and a lot of things has happened. When I was born about 50 years ago, introducing a new device uh, took a long time. It, to have 50 million users, you needed 13 years. Today, you can do the same thing, introduce a new dev device and reach many uh, users in just a couple of days. Also, if we have a look on data and how data can be used, there has really been a big change. When I was born, you could store one byte of data in one second. Now, in the same amount of time, one second, you can store 10 to the power of 10 bytes of data. And that is 10,000 million times as much data. The price of storing data has also drastically uh, reduced. <clears throat> so before you could store 10 to the power of three bytes for $1. Now you can store 10 to the power of 11 bytes for the same price. So this means that today, compared to a few years ago, you can store, you can transfer, and you can calculate data and information at no time and no cost. And this actually has drastically changed a lot of things. I would say that this is the main reason why you speak about technical revolutions. And you hear things like the med tech, the fintech, financial technology, the edtech in the education sector, log tech for logistics, agrotech, health tech. Another way of putting it is to put the word smart in front of what you're doing. Smart homes, smart health, smart cities, smart societies, and also smart manufacturing or smart industry, or as we heard here in the introduction, industry four or five. So the fact that we have access to a lot of data and can store, transfer, and calculate those has really changed a lot of things, also for, for industry. Sometimes you speak about various revolutions. So in the first one, you had, <clears throat> which is up to the uh, left here in the screen, you had the introduction of steam power, the second one, you had the introduction of electricity and thereby the possibility of having mass production. In the third one, you had the IT uh, revolution. And now in the fourth one, you have the access of data basically everywhere, as I said before, no time, no cost. And you can get data and calculations done. And that has really revolutionized how and what you can do on the production floor and also how much, uh, and that has also increased the need of getting relevant information 
on a real-time basis. Also, I would like to, to stress, stress the fact that, I mean, if you look at these uh, epochs in time, maybe there is not a big change from one day to another, but, but if you zoom out and look on it for a little bit of longer time, you can really see that there has been a change. Think, for example, what would have happened if we would not have started to use electricity? Number two here. I think it's the same question now. We need to use the data and, and do correct calculations and use that. So if we think of this smart manufacturing and, and what is included in smart manufacturing, there are really a lot of different um, aspects of it. And there are a lot of basic technologies that goes into this. One could speak of such things as Internet of Things or cloud computing or big data analytics. Of course, cybersecurity is an uh, interesting and important aspect, as well as simulations, additive manufacturing, augmented reality, and robotics. None of this would have been possible to do and use and apply to the extent that we can do today if it were not for the fact that you can store, transfer, and calculate huge amount of data in no time. That is also true for doing horizontal and vertical integration. And with that, I mean being able to connect various software and calculation systems that you have, for example, in production and production industry. There are also, there are many, many statesmen, statements about this, but this is one that is a report about the state of smart manufacturing. It was launched this year, and it says that a majority of all the manufacturing manufacturers that are using smart manufacturing technology, they use software to track plant floor, floor production data. So plant floor production data is one aspect that is really, really important for being able to, to see at the real time instant what is happening on the production floor. And if you have that information available, you can also take more clever decisions and thereby running your production at a more efficient state. I didn't say that before, but I could also stress the fact that in each of these revolutions that, that we have had, there has been a huge impact in the economical growth in the countries that have accepted and adopted it, and also in the living standards in those countries. So therefore, this issue with smart manufacturing, including the aspect of tracking plant floor production data, is one thing that is of national interest for societies around the world. And that is also the reason I would say that there are so many names on the same, uh, on the same um, say, uh, societal change that we are seeing. As I said before, just looking into production, there are names such as smart manufacturing, smart industry, industry four, industry five, uh, smart society is used also including the industrial aspects. So going in a little bit more into the fact of what is happening in order to track and have a real-time view on plant uh, production data, plant floor production data. So what is going on here on an international level? Well, there is all, uh, actually an ongoing activity defining KPIs or key performance indicators that are to be used in manufacturing for the production floor and keeping track of everything that is happening here. And this uh, international activity has the name 
ISO 22400, and that is an international standard. I said it's ongoing work. There is still uh, work that is going on in this group that is uh, writing this standard. But there has also been two drafts and two, uh, two standards that have been released. The title of this standard is uh, Automation Systems and Integration, Key Performance Indicators, KPI, for Manufacturing Operation Management. So let's have a look on what this standard what it includes. Huh. I cannot see my figure here. Ah, why is the figure not available? Ah. I'm afraid that we do not see the figures here. I will try to explain the figure. Uh, so this is then in this standard, there is a ta tabular format that you can use in order to describe KPIs. In this table, there is uh, a possibility to list the name of the KPI. There is a possibility to, in Word, uh, write a description. There is also the possibility to add the formula and the unit of measure. In addition to this, there is also possibility to include timing, which means that do you measure this on a periodic basis or an event-based based, uh, basics? or how, is the, how often is it being measured? So with this ta uh, table, it's a way of defining uh, all KPIs and how they can be described. And the basic idea here is that if we describe all KPIs in the same manner, there is also the possibility of doing making uh, data uh, formats for that and transferring the KPI definition from one system to another system. There was one field in this table that is the formula. And of course, that one is very important because if we are going to measure KPIs in different systems and at different companies, of course, one would need to use the fame, same formula and the same way of calculating a KPIs. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible to compare from one company to the other. Hmm. Ah, <laughs> there, is a there is a difficulty with the, the pictures here, it seems. I try to describe also this one. In this uh, standard, there are many different KPIs listed. One of those is the Overall Equipment Effectiveness Index, the OEE. And the OEE is a um, uh, KPI that is being used at many production facilities all around the world. And in here, it lists the description. I read it to you since you cannot see it here. It says that the OEE index represents the availability of a work unit, a machine, the effectiveness of the work unit. Sorry, sorry, Professor Johnson. Uh, can you try to share your entire screen and not only the, the slides? Maybe the problem can be... Uh, on the slides. So you should uh, leave this sharing and share again your entire screen, not only the slides. Share screen, share screen. Yep. Like to, uh, let's see if I can do this, uh, share. 
uh, what do I have? Security and privacy. Uh, I had to access. Uh, I think you have first to stop your sharing. I have first because, to stop the sharing. Okay, let's yeah, because do that. I can still see. Yeah, okay. Now you are not sharing. Okay, now let's then try share again. Screen. Yeah. Share, share screen. Share. What do you see now? Now I'm not seeing nothing. Uh, uh, go to system preferences. Uh, that. Let's try to do that fast. System preference, unlock, mm, unlock the screen by selecting. Not there. Uh, sorry, were you sharing your slides, only your slides or your full screen before? My full, mm. Before I was sharing, I uploaded the slides yeah. to the system and then uh, that was shared. So now, uh, do you have your slides on your own uh, uh, laptop? Yes. Yeah, can you share your uh, screen? Uh, it should be uh, screen sharing. Uh, yes. It, it should be the last of the three. Yes. Uh, yeah. And you if should. I select that screen sharing. Yeah. Screen sharing, uh, screen sharing works. Uh, share screen. I select that. Yeah. And then I also select entire uh, screen. Yeah. Yeah. But but nothing I is do, happening. <laughs> nothing when is I happening. Do that, uh, it says that Chrome has lost permission to capture my screen. Yeah, it's strange because... I don't uh, know. Let's see if I can just share one window, if that uh, is allowed. You should be allowed to share your screen. Screen by selecting the lock. Open system preferences and lo unlock the screen. I'm not, it doesn't seem that I'm... No, but yeah, maybe you have some personal settings on your laptop that does not allow to share your screen. So... Seems like you, it, yes. Yeah, maybe I think you should continue on your uh, slides and yes. we... <laughs> I don't know how <laughs> I have to explain. solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, uh, continue. So then I will, uh, yes. So here it shows the OEE. What it also gives you is the formula, which is the availability times the effectiveness times the quality ratio. Then in the same way, another picture that doesn't work, you have a table that shows the availability. And this availability defines exactly how availability should be calculated. And it is the uh, ratio between two values, the actual production time and the planned busy time. Now, this one at least uh, is, visual, <laughs> is viewable. So I said that availability is the uh, ratio between the actual production time, then the standard you can also read exactly what you mean with actual production time that is the production time during which a work unit a machine is producing it includes only the value added functions and that is important because here sometimes people think of actual production time in various ways so here you can read exactly what it means then the denominator in the availability calculation is the planned busy time. And the planned busy time is the operating time minus the planned downtime. So when you use when you find out what planned busy time is, you should take away the planned downtime. Again, that is very important because if companies are doing in different ways, then availability will get different numerical values. And as I said before, availability is one of the three factors in the OEE. So then also the OEE would get another numerical value. 
then I will not uh, show you this, but, but in this figure, it was showing you exactly what time slots should be included in the uh, actual production time and in the planned busy time and how they relate to each other. So this figure is included in the standard and actually shows you exactly what time you should measure to get the calculation right. There is also figures that uh, shows you uh, how different things are related to each other. So up here on the top of this figure, you see the availability. If you follow the dotted line, you could see that the availability depends on the actual production time. That was the nominator and the plant busy time. That was the denominator. So if you are not happy with the availability calculation, you could trace backwards and say that, ah, one of those two parameters are not correct, or I need to work and improve one of those. Assume you would like to improve the actual production time, the upper one here. That one has a link to the work unit, i.e. the machines. So you can go and have a look in your machines to see what is happening. And a machine is part of a work center and an area and finally a production site. So there can be improvements that you can do here. Or the work unit also has a link to the work sequence and how you have sequenced your work at the production floor. Uh, so you can also make improvements here. So by this figure, you can trace backwards to see if you would like to improve or change one of the parameters, availability, for example then where and what can you do? In the standard, of course, there are more KPIs defined than only OEE and availability. To be more precise, there are 37 KPIs that are defined. And as I said, the key aspect here is that you have the exact formula and you also have it, uh, you also have this figure that I uh, talked to you about. The KPIs that are described, I will give you just some examples here. It's the allocation ratio. It's the number six here, the overall equipment effectiveness. It is the setup rate. It is the production process ratio. It is the scrap ratio. Continue here. It is the fall off ratio. It is the finished goods ratio, the equipment load ratio, loss ratios. So there are a lot of KPIs that are being defined in this standard. So if you are working with uh, production and if you uh, are working with KPIs, this is really useful material. And again, you can find all this information in this international standard that is being developed by ISO, so iso.org. And the title of it was Automation Systems and Integration, Key Performance Indicators for Manufacturing Operation Management. And the standard, if you would like to have access to it, you can order it from the ISO site iso.org and you just search this number. So then maybe some of you are wondering what is ISO and how does it work? So I'll give you short information about that as well. ISO is the International Organization for Standardization. It's an organization that was recognized by the World Trade Organization and it has members all over the world and it's ran in a very democratic way. So ISO is the uh, international organization and that one has mirror organization both at the European level and then at the national level. In Sweden, where I am, the national organization is called CIS. In Italy, it's called UNI. In, uh, in Germany, it's called DIN. So there are national mirror 
organizations in almost all countries around the globe or if not all the 200 so i think there are 190 member countries in iso in each country there can be a lot of national members in sweden we have more approximately 5000 members and more than 2000 companies that participates in discussing the content of a standard so they are meeting discussing these kpis they are reviewing the formulas and in the end they are voting on the result the same is true for germany italy morocco india and as i said yeah the 190 countries around the world that part participate in iso i also said it's run in a very democratic way and with that i mean that when it comes to voting about the standard if it should be accepted on an international level or not each country has one vote so that means that you cannot send in a lot of people and just have it have the result that your country you cannot dominate everything it has to be done in a de democratic way so how is the standard developed well as i said you have meetings on the national level this is what i have on the left side on the screen here where i illustrated it with the swedish uh, meeting around the table when we are discussing kpis we have small and medium enterprises we are we have uh, academics we have branch organizations we have larger companies we have smaller companies we have users we have integrators so there is a large variety in the type of uh, users that are represented and they review the material and they can also come with new proposals they could for example make a proposal about an additional kpi or they can make a proposal of changing the formula of one of the kpis the suggestions are sent to the international level that you see on the right side here and here you have one expert from each country they sit around the table and they discuss the content of the standard and they review all the comments that have been sent in and they update the standard accordingly. When they are happy with the result, they send out the standard for voting. And if all countries or a majority of the countries vote yes, then it means that the standard is accepted as an international and industrial standard. And this, of course, make a lot of sense for, for companies that are producing softwares that measures KPIs because they can say that they measure it in a correct way or in a way that is done according to an international standard. Standards in general, they also, of course, are important if if we look at it at a more broader perspective they are important for the sustainable development goals more specifically this standard about kpis that relates to smart manufacturing has a big impact in the goal sdg number nine the industry innovation and infrastructure so Therefore, all of the standards that are being developed within ISO are also tagged with what SDGs they relate to. And this one that deals with uh, KPIs relate to SDG number nine. This is uh, the next to last slide that I have. And I also just wanted to make you aware of this booklet that has recently been uh, written and if you're interested you can also order it and it can be sent to you for free or it can be downloaded it's a, a booklet that is called the golden standard and it's a booklet that describes the value adding role of standards in history 
as well as today, as well as do giving some prediction of why standards are so important now when we digitalize our industry. What role do they play and why is that important? As I said in the beginning, for, for a, on a national level for economical growth and uh, increasing living standards. So the booklet is called The Golden Standard in English. And you also here find the link to how, how to download it if you would find that interesting. If you have questions, you are of course welcome to ask me questions now. I would be more than happy to answer those. If not, I have also added here my email address and you are uh, of course welcome to send me emails or contact me in any other ways if you have questions about KPIs on the production floor or questions about uh, smart manufacturing, smart industry in general. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Johnson, for this very nice uh, presentation. I'm very sorry for the problems we, we had, but it was a, a wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Yeah, Just me too. Wait. I'm sorry. I don't know why the figures didn't work out, but no, I hope okay, you understood no the message. You were very clear also in explaining uh, uh, those slides. Um, just wait some seconds for uh, uh, seeing if any there is any end. Uh, question from the audience. Uh, maybe I can start because I have a, I have a question uh, yes. while waiting for other questions from YouTube or uh, LinkedIn. So uh, you have described several technologies concerning smart manufacturing, but uh, which one of them do you think has the major potential in terms of future developments on performance management and measurement? Ah, uh, it's a very good, uh, good question. Of course, all of these technologies that I mentioned in the beginning are of importance for smart manufacturing or smart industry in general. For the ones that are linked to uh, KPIs and pro uh, performance uh, and production tracking, I think big data analytics has a, a huge impact because you can measure and you can measure so much more and you can get the results in a short, yeah, just microsecond. You can get it real time. And I think that makes a really big difference. You don't have to wait for a weekly report or a monthly uh, report where you could see how are we doing with production. You can have this performed to you in real time. Yeah. And I've been at many companies that now set up large screens and they see how all of these production uh, indexes are changing on a yeah, minute by minute basis. And I think yes. that will revolutionize how, how you do and how you run the, the production. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we have also a question from Marco Bicchi, uh, who says, thank you, Professor, it is an interesting presentation. Do you think that the OE indicator is now very well known and already implemented by organizations, or is there any area of improvement? If yes, could you please eventually indicate us any of them? Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a broad question. I will, could answer if I think it's already well known. I can answer both yes and no. When I go to industry, I visit some and they have used OEE for uh, yeah, more than one yeah, couple of years, actually. So for them, it's very well known and they use it as a daily tool for, for uh, improving production. But I have also been to others that do not use it. So there is still a, a, big, uh, a big need for uh, knowledge sharing about how OEE works and how it can be used and what uh, uh, value adding, uh, value added, uh, what do you say, value added values it has. Yeah. Okay, we have maybe the time for the last question from Marcello Ferra. Uh, how to set the right KPIs in different departments of companies? Ah, that is also a very good question. Usually, when I speak to, to companies about KPIs, 
I start to ask them what is important for them on an uh, on a high level. I mean, do they compete with the best quality or do they compete with the uh, quickest time or do they have products that are the most flexible? And depending on the question, I mean, if they compete with time, then you would like to have a lot of KPIs where you try to find where you have bottlenecks and remove do those uh, unnecessary time uh, if you compete with money, then you should measure something else. It's not time that is equally. If you uh, compete with flexibility and having customized products, then it's maybe setup time that is important for you to measure. So it depends a little bit what is the overall goal of the company. And I always start in that uh, end rather than just tell them to measure everything. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. I think we have no no other questions and we are just in time. So thank you very much again for your presentation and thank you for your answers to uh, to the questions. Yeah, thank let you. Me, let me introduce the second keynote speaker, uh, who is Richard Keegan, Professor Richard Keegan, adjunct associate professor at the business school at Trinity College in Dublin and visiting associate professor at the University of Northern Iowa also guest lecturer at the Technical University of Berlin. He acts as the advisor to the world-class activities of the EU-Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation since 20 years. So thank you, Professor Keegan, for being uh, with us and for your, uh, for your lecture. Please share your screen and uh, go on. Thank you. Hello, everybody, um, and thank you for that invitation and to participate in this conference and to Professor Janssen for her presentation this morning. Um, she made me feel very old when she said she was born in 1970. I was born in 1958. So it brings to, to mind um, how long I've been trying to help people and understand this thinking about operational excellence, about performance management, and uh, how we can actually not just manage performance, but improve performance. So as we go through this presentation, I hope to share some of these thoughts with you. The one thing that's very clear today is we're living in a really strange time. I suppose all humans have frequently lived in strange times, but to us, certainly, with the things that are happening in our world, it's really, really volatile. We don't know what's going to come next. It's rather complex. It's not clear what's going to happen. It's not clear that A will equal B or C will follow on from B. And certainly, we just have that unease about what's happening. It's not quite clear what's going on. From an operational perspective, our role is to try to create robust systems that can respond to the needs of the marketplace so that they won't be knocked off if something goes wrong that if they are knocked off their performance, they can reduce the impact to their outputs uh, through their resilience. And if they do hit a disaster, they can return back quickly. How do we do all of that? Well, this is the challenge we're facing. Uh, and I hope to share some thoughts with you on it. To me, the approach is using what we call lean thinking, uh, operational excellence, best practice, world-class, uh, frankly, um, I don't care what we call it, but it is about using the best abilities that we have as humans, uh, going back to our shared experience over many, many years, and realizing that we can do things to try to make things better. Currently, there's a, an argument going on between whether the approach will be agile or lean. I was at an event in Florence on Wednesday, um, a very good conference, very challenging conference where the question was, you know, should it be agile, should it be lean? And in my thinking, the names are irrelevant. What it really comes down to is people understanding what's happening and trying to find ways to make it better. I've always talked about um, having facts and trying to understand the realities as opposed to perceptions of what's going on. And that led me down to be involved heavily in benchmarking. I led European benchmarking for four years for the European Commission at their request. And to me, benchmarking was a diagnosis, a way of capturing what the actual situation was. 
And Professor Janssen's uh, presentation triggered many thoughts of the past, where we created a European benchmarking forum, captured measures, defined interpretations of what the measure should be, and captured many thousands and thousands of company data sets from right across Europe. Eventually bringing that to the United Nations Industrial Development Organization for developments in sub-Saharan Africa, but always trying to capture the facts to help drive performance management improvement. So facts, evidence, diagnosis, real fact and real data, trying to find ways to help people improve where they are from to be able to get better. Uh, in preparing for it this morning, uh, I checked my hair in the mirror. I realized my hair looked great. But in actual fact, when you look at my hair, actually, I'm actually very follically challenged. And it's very hard for businesses to be able to look in the mirror and self-diagnose. So that's where benchmarking and real fact and real data helps companies to see the realities as they are and not as how they think they are. Some facts on Ireland. It's hard for us to look at ourselves in Ireland. But when we looked at Ireland, we're a small nation on the extreme west of the European Union, very much on the extreme west uh, following Brexit, uh, four and a half million people. But I was focused in my work for Enterprise Ireland, where I was trying to help Irish companies be better. And when we benchmarked, what we realized was that Irish SMEs had a relative performance of 68 against the European standards. Is 68 good or bad? Doesn't sound great. But when you looked at the reality, Spain's equivalent number was 66. The Portuguese was 69. So we're more or less the same as Spain and Portugal. Um, but the average in Europe at the time was 83. And our prime comparator quite frequently is Luxembourg. They were at the 100 mark. So when we looked at Ireland, we realized that we were actually not as good as we could be, should be, and had to be. And we had to take some steps. The steps we took, the work I was involved in, in Enterprise Ireland, developing, creating a rollout of an approach called the Lean Business Offer. Why the Lean Business Offer? How was it created? Three levels of support, uh, helping companies adopt and adapt good practice at whatever level they were at, intermediary, introductory, and advanced, and trying to improve their uh, performance management results. The impacts of the program were quite, quite acceptable. We saw a 40% increase in sales, a 20% increase in productivity, an 11% increase in employment using counterfactual econometric analysis. So comparing companies who had participated in the program against those who had not, uh, adjusting for size, scale, sector, age, etc., we saw there was a, a, a significant improvement over the norm by those who took on the lean thinking. What was the basis of this lean thinking? Well, lean is widely understood to be based on the Toyota production system. And a former, a recently retired senior manager from Toyota shared this definition of lean that he understood it to be, as being a leadership team that builds the capability and capacity of their people to be able to identify and fix problems constantly. If we try to understand that definition, it's leaders who make the choice, make a decision to say, we will build the ability of our people. We will give them the opportunity to create time in their day to identify what can be made better and to do something to make it better. Actually impacting on the performance management results. When we look at the actual publications out there, uh, lean principles basically came from the machine that changed the world, uh, Jim Womack, Dan Jones and Rose. And they talked about certain principles of identifying value, mapping a value stream, creating flow, establishing pull and looking for perfection. And they effectively identified what is known today as the Toyota production system. They saw that that system was working more effectively than the systems we were using in the West at the time. Jeffrey Leica wrote a book called The Toyota Way, and he effectively identified the combination of the hearts and minds of people with the tools and the techniques. 
And the combination of the tools and the techniques and the hearts and the minds led and leads to superior performance. I worked for the Irish government for 29 years in Enterprise Ireland, the State Development Agency. And one of the, the activities I strongly believed in was not just to tell people what they needed to do to get better, but to show them what better looked like. So in one of those activities, we were on a visiting program in North America. We visited Harley Davidson, and we had the great pleasure to meet a gentleman called Roy Colvin, who was their VP for Advanced Manufacturing Systems, effectively a sensei uh, in America in terms of lean thinking and lean deployment. I asked him to read one of my books, uh, a book called Applied Benchmarking for Competitiveness. And he said he would, and he said he would give me feedback. So when I contacted him, I said, Roy, what did you think of the book? And his reply was, I said, he mustn't have heard me. So I said again, maybe it's a bad telephone connection. Roy, what did you think of the book? He said, well, it was okay, Richard. Oh, now I don't speak a lot of American, but I speak some American, and okay is not good. I asked him repeatedly, and he just said, silence. And I was very concerned. I said, why would this fantastic guy not answer a straightforward question? And it made me think and think and think and think and think. And the more I thought, I realized he had answered the question. And what he had said was, you must think what are the principles, the rules, and the tools that are relevant to Ireland and your context if you want to make a difference, Richard. That set me off on a train of thought. And I subsequently added questions to those three points that Roy asked me to look at. And these are not the lean principles as determined by Womack and Jones and the general body of international thought, but they're my effort to understand what are the principles of lean that applied in Ireland, four and a half million people on the extreme west of the uh, European Union. Time, money, effort. Every business, every industry, profit-making, charitable, can understand time, money, and effort. How long does it take to get a job done? Are we making or losing money? Are we using the money that, that volunteers give us wisely or badly? How hard is it to do the job we're trying to do? Everyone understands those. And for years, they were my three principles of lean, until I realized I had to also say about respect and challenge. I thought they were understood by everybody, but I realized subsequently they were not. Respect. We must respect our customers. We must respect the law. We must respect the environment. We must respect each other. We must have self-respect if we want to try to get better and challenge. How can we do better what we are doing today? Can we accept that it is not yet a finished article, that there is possibility to make things better? For Lean to work, these principles need to be integrated into the company strategy, into the actual performance management system the business is using, so that there's alignment between the principles and what the business is trying to achieve. In terms of rules, I thought there was rules for people and rules for processes. Fair, firm and consistent. Fairly obvious, but important that we follow that fairness, firmness and consistency when we deal with our people. And then for processes. Many will have heard of plan, do, check, act, uh, classically known as the Toyota approach. I never got the act piece. I didn't get it. I can, people can explain it to me and I understand the explanation, but the word act didn't resonate with me. So in my thinking, I was looking at what were the rules. I said, if you want to improve a process, you must look at the process. You must see what is actually happening. Not be blinded by your understanding of what it should be like, but actually see what's actually happening. You must understand what's causing the effects. You must think how to make it better, and then you must do something to constantly improve the process to move things forward. And then there are five fundamental tools. You can buy a book by Duran, thousands of pay, a thousand plus pages of the, the tools of quality. To me, these are the five fundamental tools of quality, of quality improvement, of performance management improvement. First, you must know your process, so map your process. Uh, we call it the spaghetti diagram, usually because it looks like a plate of spaghetti once you map the movement of materials, of information of people through a process, as relevant in an office environment as in a manufacturing environment. Physical flow mapping. What's the movement of people? 
What are the steps they're doing? How are we actually capturing what's being done by the business to deliver? Check sheets, what's going wrong? Let the process tell us what is going wrong. Let's find ways to make it visible from the process so that we can see what is going wrong. A run chart, are things getting better? Or are they getting worse? Can we make it visible so our people can react quickly in real time to make the systems work better? And teams, the fundamental bedrock of all of this. As one person, you can do good things. As a team, you can do things that are beyond the multiplier of the number of people involved. But then I also found there were some key questions. And I was visiting a, a very, 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 very good German company, second highest EBIT in the German stock exchange. And after two days, I was in a small room with 30 managers, and they asked me, how do I always know how to ask the right question? And I was, in a, <laughs> I was a bit concerned because I had asked many questions, I thought, until I realized I'd asked five questions. Can you please tell me what are you doing? How are you doing it? Why are you doing it like that? Who is going to improve it and when? So the first three questions are about capturing the facts of the situation. And the last two questions are about the improvement of the situation. How do we make things better? So when we're talking about performance management, getting the facts is one thing. Finding out how to make them better is the second key and essential aspect. I was involved in benchmarking for many years and had the pleasure to work as, uh, at a, with Professor Chris Voss of London Business School on a tool he developed um, with Phil Hansen of IBM Consulting, which looked at the balance between practice the companies were employing and the performance levels they were achieving. We were able to map out a constellation of companies from the very top end where they were really performing excellently down to the bottom end where companies had significant challenges to perform. We were able to identify how they could address what they needed to do to move their situations forward. We captured data, quantitative and qualitative, numbers and also the uh, softer sides of the performance activities. And we benchmarked these data sets. And what we found when we looked at the overview of the performance levels, that the top companies typically had twice as much sales per employee as the bottom companies. They had four times less staff turnover. They had eight times sales growth, nine times profitability, and 10 times better return on assets from the top companies to the bottom companies. Now, that was the research we did in Ireland. And as I said earlier in the week, I was in Forenza, and Professor Andrea Forlan presented at the Lean Agile Summit uh, his understandings. And he saw a 44% difference between the top companies and the bottom companies in Italy. In actual fact, I believe we need a renaissance in performance management. We need to remember what we have learned and build upon that again. Because if we could get the poor performing companies to move towards the average level of performance, we would dramatically, dramatically change the overall competitiveness of our individual regions, our countries, and the European Union as a whole. The renaissance is not necessarily to create new, but to find ways to remember and to use the new to develop and to build on from that. Professor Janssen is very focused on the current world, the smart industries, the smart world, the integration of the resources that are available to us today. Now, I'm an engineer. I trained as a mechanical engineer. And in the top left-hand corner of the slide, you may see a slide rule. Some of you may not even know what a slide rule is. If you don't know what it is, it's an early form of computational device, an early calculator. It's what I started my engineering career with. If you want to see it in real life and work, watch the film Apollo 13, and you'll see the NASA engineers using slide rules to do the calculations to get a mass around the moon and back to Earth safely. We're living in a different world today. I brought a slide rule to an engineering class I was teaching in Trinity College Dublin, and they said, what's that? We don't know what that is. Now, my life stretches from slide rules to, to computers that are in our pockets, our mobile phones, that have more power than any computer that was used to send men to the moon and back. 
we would not suggest using slide rules today unless, of course, the electricity goes off completely and you can't charge your phone or your computer. Then it could be a very handy thing to have. But how do we use the systems, the approaches, the creativity that has been developed over our world and before to build our world in a better way using uh, real fact and real data to help us drive the performance management delivery and improvement for our businesses going forward. Lean for me in the digital world, what's going to be new? Well, actually we'll have more data. And as an engineer, actually having more data is a good thing. We'll have better machines and processes. Maybe. I worked for many years making nappies, babies, diapers, and had a Swedish machine that could make 100,000 a, a shift. I had a Japanese machine with the latest of technologies that could make between zero and 110,000 a shift. Maybe the machines will have more complications on them and be more complex, but they might not necessarily be better, or maybe they will be better. We'll have better sensors. Will we have better people? The big question is, is what are we going to do with the data that the sensors and the systems will give us? How do we build our people's ability to be able to understand what the data is telling us? How can we create an in-depth understanding to be able to use the data to find ways to move forward? I tried to create a, a thinking set of how to drive Ireland forward using what I call the lean business offer, three different levels, the complexity of the tools, the availability of the thinking, expanding as the company's ability increased and moved forward, the thinking of look, see, understand, think and do, which led to very significant impacts in Ireland. I'm currently rolling it out in Wales with the Welsh government and Toyota for companies in Wales. And as I said, probably some of you have heard of Plan, Do, Check, Act and the, the, the Toyota approach based on the Deming cycle, the Schuhart cycle. But funnily enough, quite recently, they've added Observe, Plan, Do, Check, Act. I know this because I have a strong relationship with Toyota. As I said, I'm working with them and for them with the Welsh government. And I've been visiting their engine plant in North Wales, an exceptional place uh, for the last 13 years, currently on 92 visits to the facility. But the thinking is, is about building capability in a continuous way as the spiral moves upwards, uh, we build understanding and ability to do more. Which led me not necessarily to focus on KPIs. Because to me, KPIs are looking backwards. They're results that were achieved. And quite recently, the pleasure to work with uh, Tor Vergata uh, with Max Giraldi, Professor Giraldi, and uh, Mr. Lusso, uh, the PhD student, uh, in writing, co-authoring a paper on KPIs and KAIs. KPIs are the performance measures. It's what was achieved. KAIs are looking at the key activity indicators. What are we going to do to try to improve our performance and our systems and our people and our processes so that our KPIs will be better in the future? Do you want to drive the car by looking backwards to see where we've been or by looking forward and see how we're going to be better able to take the next turn or the next straight? The future of business for me in my thinking is not is in how well we do it together. How well we can combine the latest tools, techniques, data sources, sensors, thinking with what we've already learned in the past, the renaissance sort of building upon what we have learned and using the current techniques to move the game forward in an absolutely focused and relentless way. I coined this model while I was down with Fiat Chrysler in Turin with Luciano Massoni and we were talking and I suggested if we could create a situation where the sales team, the ops team and the development team were working together, we would create a sweet spot. If we could integrate the suppliers with the ops and the development teams, we would create a second sweet spot and do it all for the company and for the customer. It became what I call the five rings of lean business excellence, and I share that. Uh, as I move to conclude, the last action I did before retiring from Enterprise Ireland was to create a, 
with many colleagues across the country, what we call Lean Business Ireland, a forum where ideas and concepts and case studies can be shared. And if you choose to go to Lean Business Ireland, you will find many examples of what Irish companies have done to improve. You'll also find examples of my writings. When I write, the proceeds go to cancer research, so please buy them. I'm getting nothing. It's all going to uh, trying to destroy cancer. But on the site, you'll find Becoming Lean, Becoming a Lean Service Company. You'll probably be able to find the five rings of lean business excellence. The books Lean Service and Applied Benchmarking uh, for Competitiveness are on sale. And most recently, uh, Digital Lean, co-authored with uh, Heiko Gerhardt and Stefan Schmidt, uh, Senior Director in Jaguar Land Rover and BMW. Trying to get the thinking brought forward in an effective way, um, I approached the National Standards Authority of Ireland. As Professor Johnson says, standards are important. And we wrote what we called a SWIFT guide, a standard written in fast track for the adoption and deployment of lean in Ireland. Uh, so we took a, a SWIFT guide to what does lean mean and how to deploy it in Ireland. And most recently, if you choose to Google the Toyota Lean Cluster Programme, you will find a, a simple thing I've written, Toyota in everyman language, trying to explain the Toyota words and what they mean to somebody who's not in Toyota, to share a, an insight into where their depth of thinking in the lean deployment is interesting. Maybe Professor Johans would be happy to hear or unhappy to hear, but Toyota do not use OEE, they use OPR. Uh, overall production rate, where they have identified how many they should make in a day, and then they look at how many they made in a day. And it gives a very quick feedback in terms of how effective the process is. But as I said, that information is available on the uh, Toyota Lean Cluster Program website uh, at the support of the Welsh Government and Toyota. Finally, to all you developing your businesses, trying to improve your performance management, Please believe that just because you can't do it doesn't mean it can't be done. This is an example of doing a wheelie on a gold wing. Any guy who drives a gold wing knows it's impossible to do a wheelie. Well, actually, it is possible. I've seen the video. It's, it's frightening. These guys probably had beer in the cases at the back of the motorbike. They don't look happy and relaxed. If for some reason I had to do a wheelie on a gold wing, I would remove the beer from the back boxes. I put steel in, something heavy. I would not be wearing blue jeans. I'd wear full motorcycle protective equipment and I'd have good insurance. The point I'm trying to make is you need to know what's possible to drive your efforts to improve your performance in your business. To understand what levels of improvement you need to achieve to achieve better and world-class levels of performance management. If you can't do that, there's a problem. If you can, good. Hardy Davidson shared this phrase with me, lead, follow, or please get out of the way. So for Europe to thrive, for the world to thrive, for everybody in manufacturing to be most sustainable and effective with the use of resources, we need not to waste our time, our energy, our resources, our people. We need to use the systems that are currently available, to use the renaissance of remembering what we've already learned, and to see how we can deploy it in an effective way so that we can actually find ways to be more effective together into the future for a sustainable world. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I hope this has been of some interest and help to you in your improvement journeys to deliver true uh, performance management and true performance improvement into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Keegan, for this very nice, interesting, and as Filippo De Carlo said, also meaningful presentation. Uh, for sure, I agree. I completely agree with the Keegan Lean uh, principles. So we already have a couple of questions. Um, Marcello from Marcello Ferra, who asks, how to choose and set, uh, and set up the right KPI to measure the, the performance in production? Is it better to have a KPI such as OEE, or is it better to have many KPIs, in your opinion? Mm. 
I, I wrote a, a book. I was asked by a, a Professor Yamashina at Kyoto University, uh, since retired, to put English language onto his slide deck. I spent 15 pages describing OEE. It was effectively a very deep treatise on the work of the JIPM and Professor Yamashina's thinking. So 15 pages to describe how to calculate OEE. Most people, when I worked in industry, would have difficulty understanding half of that. So I think it's important that if we're looking at it, we have to understand the cascade of metrics. And if I'm working with a person on a production line, they can probably easily identify how many did we make? How many were good? How many were bad? How many? <laughs> if I ask them to determine the statistical distribution of the defects across their product, their production, they're probably going, what? So to me, it's important that the measures that are used are relevant to the person who is and who can affect them. That was distributing the requirement to improve the performance measure. So OEE to me is complicated. <laughs> um, how many? How many were good? How many were bad? Why? Right? So it comes down to the metrics. Now, if I'm talking to the board, yes. the board probably don't want to know how many. They probably want to know well, how much did we make? For sure, for sure. So it comes down to identifying what's the right measure for the person who can affect the outcome of that measure. Yes. Does yes. that make sense? Yes, yes. Thank you very much for this answer, Professor. Yeah, we have also another question from uh, Saverio Ferraro, who asks, is there any specific situation in which the five fundamental lean tools should be applied can you eventually share your experience concerning that implementation? I have yet to find an area where they cannot be applied. <laughs> uh, I'll, give, I'll give some examples. I'm currently, and for the last number of years, have been working with the guide dogs for the blind in Ireland. So where they, and I, I love dogs, so don't take the word wrong. My, remember, English is my second language. I'm an Irishman, so I might use the wrong word. Where they produce dogs. So effectively, there's a process that will create a pup, train it, and match it to somebody who needs a dog to help them to live in society more freely, a guide dog. We applied the five tools. How can we understand the steps to make the dog? How can we understand where things are going? How can we understand what's going right or wrong? How can we see if it's getting better or worse? And how can we work as a team? Those five tools. The number of dogs went from 18 dogs to 35 dogs. In industry all the time, please go look and see what's happening. Try to understand what's going right or wrong. Think about it and then do something to make it better. So once again, I'm, I have a concept I'm working on at the moment in the real world, action research, trying to rapidly develop a Kaizen team in a company. It's a thought I've had. Why do we spend so much time teaching people when they could actually learn by doing? So I'm working in an industry that has had many people try to help them over the years, and the shop floor people, fantastic people, are going and looking and seeing and doing the process steps, what actually does it take to do the job and the movements. And because they're using these very simple tools, they're saying, this looks silly. This is stupid. And then I just say, yep, yeah, what do you want to do? And they start changing things around. So really actively using the tools, but not on a theoretical basis, very simple. Now, if we want to talk complicated and sophisticated, I'd be very happy to start talking about the 15 pages of OEE. But I honestly believe the simpler we make things, the more effective they can be. So those five tools, I have yet to find somewhere where they're not applicable. And it really is, what are you doing? How are you doing it? Why are you doing it like that? Now, you don't use that tone when you're talking to people. Yes. What are you doing? How are you doing it? Why are you doing it like that? <laughs> you don't say, why are you doing it like that? 
<laughs> those five tools, I've yet to find somewhere where they're not applicable. And just on sharing the examples, please go to the Lean Business Ireland. There's hundreds of case examples where people have been applying the, the tools in the context. Hundreds. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor. We have the last question from Professor Maria Grazia Agnoni from Uni Salento. Uh, says, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. Only one curiosity. According to your opinion, link APIs could be integrated with sustainability issues. I, I don't understand how it's not integrated into sustainability issues. I, but it depends on your definition. To me, lean is about doing good and as much good as you can with the least amount of effort, the least amount of resources, the least amount of everything. In my work in Enterprise Ireland, I had the pleasure, I was given the green team. So back in the days before it was sustainability, there were the green team. And this is before sustainability was popular, before the sustainability goals were developed. And they thought they were going to come to me and I would not understand because I was into lean and competitiveness. And all. I said, guys, how can the company be lean if it's not being effective and efficient with its resources? if it's using too much material, using the wrong material, using too much water, too much energy, right? There's a perfect match if we accept that society needs to sustain itself and be sustained. Do we do it in a sensible way, using the least amount of energy and people, resources, water, etc., Or do we do it in a silly way, just, you know, burn stuff and it doesn't really matter? So to me, the integration is is and always has been seamless. And I don't believe in camps. I'm in the green camp. I'm in the lean camp. I'm in the agile camp. I don't, ex I don't accept that. I don't accept the pigeonholing. Never have. I know I should, but I don't. Because I think life is too important. And it's too important that we do things well as opposed to fighting our own particular space. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor, for your very nice presentation and your, so your, your answers. So now um, we have a break, uh, just an advice for all, because we are a little bit late uh, on, the, on the time, but uh, we have some delay also on, uh, on LinkedIn. So uh, please, for the authors, for the presenters, uh, I please do connect uh, at the right time indicated in the schedule in the program we sent in the last days. So uh, we have a break. We have only seven minutes of break, uh, not 15 more, but this was a very nice discussion. So we enjoyed it. Um, and see you in uh, very few minutes at 11 a.m. when we will start uh, with the, our session of papers. See you in a few minutes.
Okay, so uh, here we are. Let's restart with the Copperman conference. And uh, let me introduce the first paper presented in, the, in this uh, conference by Mr. Joshua Prakash, who will be the presenter, and Mr. Wen Yao Yong. The paper is titled Discrete Event Simulation as a Remote Decision Making Tool for Improving Overall Line Efficiency. Uh, I don't know if uh, Mr. Prakash is with us. Yes, I can see him. Are you able to share your screen, Mr. Prakash? You are muted. We cannot hear you. Uh, yes, now we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Are you able to uh, share your screen? Uh, I still can't share. I'm sorry. Wait, let me try one more time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Can you see my screen? No, unfortunately not. No. You should go in the lower part can... of your uh, screen and you should see a screen with a plus to share. Uh, oh yeah, I think if, I can't if, find it. But if you are using a tablet. Yeah, but if you have any problem, we have your video, so we can send your video if you prefer. Uh, yeah, I think for now you can show the video because I can't find it. So yeah, okay. So uh, let's see you in a few minutes for uh, the questions and answer session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua, and I will be presenting uh, the paper titled Discrete Event Simulation as a Remote Decision-Making Tool for Improving Overall Line Efficiency. This paper is co-authored by uh, Yong Wen Yao and myself. So a bit about the background of this research. Um, what is decision-making? Decision-making is actually uh, evaluating several options to determine which option is the best one to be chosen. So when we talk about decision making, it's important we choose a viable tool that enables us to evaluate among the alternatives. So uh, ever since the pandemic began, uh, remote working are extensively adopted. In addition to that, uh, most companies are encouraging uh, the use of software attributed to this remote decision, uh, remote working. However, there is a lack of a comprehensive framework on integrating simulation with decision making, especially for remote working in the context of process improvement. Therefore, the aim of this paper is to test the feasibility of a new decision making framework for system performance improvement. We achieve this aim through the objective which is to develop and validate the new framework through a case study. Uh, a bit about the scope of this research. Uh, discrete Event Simulation or DES was used as a decision-making tool, Minitab was used to analyze the result, and this case study was conducted at a packaging manufacturing company in Malaysia. So we have done two literature reviews. The first review is on decision-making tools. Based on the review, uh, most companies uh, prefer not to adopt analytical and mathematical model because of the complexity involved. However, uh, DES is frequently used because uh, simulation models are relatively easy to construct. Next, this, uh, for a further review was conducted to evaluate and components of a framework. It can be seen that uh, most frameworks are not comprehensive enough to include all the necessary steps it requires. So therefore, the aim of this paper is to include all the steps that we have reviewed so far to form a comprehensive framework that will enable remote decision making to be carried out, carried out successfully. So uh, this is the layout of the framework. As you can see, there are three uh, stages. The top represents the stage the middle represents the objective and the bottom white boxes represents the steps involved to achieve the objectives. So now I will go through one by one for each 
stage involved. Firstly, the initiation stage. The objective of this stage is to understand the problem and direction of the case study company. So the steps involved basically are understanding the system, identify the problems, set performance benchmark, define goals, objectives, and criteria weights for the decision elements. Next, in the modeling stage, the objective of this stage is to build simulation model to imitate the system. The steps involved are collecting data from the system, building a simulation model, as well as verify and validating the model. In the analysis stage, the objective is to generate relevant solutions. This can be done by performing root cause analysis with the aid of the simulation model construct previously and identify area to be prioritized for improvement. Solutions are generated to, sell, to solve the relevant root causes and this is then uh, performed via design of experiment. A simulation model of the solutions that are feasible are constructed and attribute values are designated. After the simulation run, ANOVA analysis is performed and uh, performance measures of each decision criterion are normalized to obtain an overall performance score. Based on this, the one that gives the best overall performance score is selected. Finally, a course of action plan for the implementation is developed based on the selected best overall performance. Now for the case study. Uh, this case study was conducted in a packaging manufacturing company. A bit of background about this company. It is a job shop, make to order, there are six workstations and six product types involved. Based on uh, production control reports, there are few observations about this a specific uh, production area that is selected, namely uh, there is a congested WIP area and large amount of waste. Based on financial reports as well, there are undesired costs such as overtime allowances and penalty for late delivery and poor, uh, poor, poor product quality. Therefore, uh, in setting the performance benchmark, OLE or overall line efficiency was selected. The goal is to improve the OLE by at least 15%. It is good to be informed that OLE bears similarity to OEE, but this is specifically for the context of a manufacturing line instead of just a machine. To, uh, on top of that, to seek for solutions that is effective in attaining goal, effective in diminishing costs and reducing waste and late delivery, as well as to incur minimum time and cost for implementation, the decision criteria involved are OLE, scrap rate, flow time, level of difficulty or OLE, as well as equipment cost effectiveness, ECE. All these are selected as the performance criteria. It is good to note that these performance criteria are selected based on the objectives to be achieved. Next, uh, weights are assigned to each of the criteria based on inputs from various levels of the organization such as managers and production control personnel. The score and the description for all the scores assigned for the weights are as seen in the table shown. Next, in the model modeling stage, a simulation data was constructed. Prior to this, Data collection for the work cycle time, a uh, work element time, cycle time of the machine, as well as the weight of scrap, uh, scrap generated was collected. Uh, the total data that was collected was worth one full working day. Based on all this data collected, the simulation was then constructed with a warm up time of 6000 hours and a run time of 2160 hours, which corresponds to 3 months. Next, the verification of the simulation model. The parameter chosen for verification, uh, the validation, is the, is the line scrap rate. Based on the actual line scrap rate collected from the production floor and the simulated data, there is a difference of 12.93%, which is less than the acceptable 15%. 
Aside from this, verification to test for the correctness of the model is also proven. Next, the analysis. Based on the simulation model, it was observed that the printer and the corrugator are two systems that face uh, issues. Namely, the inefficient printer setup model, which corresponds to <coughs> quality check form, single mini ex uh, quality check form, single mini exchange die, and in increasing the setup of worker, which are potential solutions. For low throughput rate at the printing workstation, potential solutions are increasing machine and revising the job scheduling rule. Next, poor troubleshooting for poor troubleshooting skills, potential solutions are improving the troubleshooting skills of the op operator. So based on this, a supplementary simulation model was built for each of these potential solutions, namely one simulation model for the printer and one simulation model for the corrugator. Based on the simulation model that was constructed, the input values for the future simulation model was able to be generated. In enhancing pre, uh, printer setup efficiency, uh, the setup times and the number of setups that were to be performed were simulated from the previous simulation model and input from this model serves as uh, output from the previous simulation model serves as input to the bigger simulation model for the overall line. So there are a total of five parameters to be simulated which corresponds to 288 combination of alternatives. After the simulation was performed, ANOVA was performed to filter out solutions that do not play any impact. It was observed that D, the job scheduling rule, has no significant impact on all the decision criteria, which is all the performance measure. So this solution was removed from the decision making and remaining with 71 combinations. From these remaining 71 combinations, the values of A, B, C, D and E, which were the parameters, were normalized to the obtain an overall score. Based on the overall score, two out of five solutions were selected, which is to enhance printer setup efficiency by implementing QC form as well as improving operator troubleshooting skills. At the end of this stage, the cost of implementation for these actions were uh, designed. Namely, the LOD for QC form, the LOD score of 2, operators can adapt quickly with the changes made in the work elements and for improving troubleshooting skill, the LOD or level of difficulty score of 5. The main concern was human factor. Operators might be unable to meet due to limitation in skill and knowledge. Finally, the contributions of this framework are it successfully uh, promotes remote decision making, quality of solutions and practicability of the solutions. This is especially important in the day of uh, as more engineers are uh, opting to work from home attributed to the pandemic. So this is all for my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Prakash, for your very nice uh, presentation. I'm sorry that you were not able to share to share your screen, but for sure you can now uh, answer to, to the questions, if any, from the uh, attendees. Let's wait a few seconds. Yeah, we have uh, a question from uh, Raffaele Abate, who asks, concerning the level of difficulty score, how did you identify a score for each solution? How could you assign this value? Ah, OK. So uh, in assigning the score for level of difficulty, the same uh, personnel who contributed to the score for all the decision criteria, they have also assigned these scores for the level of difficulty. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, is there any other question? Thank you for this answer. Uh, if not, I have uh, a curiosity. 
because I read the paper, it was very interesting. And you say that you have applied the AHP method, the analytic hierarchy process method in your case study. But how did you apply it? And especially uh, how many people were involved with the, in, this, uh, in this process and what was their expertise? Okay, so um, the personnel who contributed to the score for the AHP are yeah. basically one uh, production manager, the engineer, and two line supervisors because the line supervisors uh, instead of the technicians are more familiar with the overall process flow. So there are only four people involved. Of course, in this case, uh, Yong Wen Yao, who is the one carrying out the study, she's the one who's collecting input from everyone. So actually, the purpose of everyone's uh, contribution in this area is to just assign the score. When they're assigning the score, it's done during a discussion, how they yeah. perceive. Uh, so once the score is collected, then uh, Wen Yao will uh, collect this and input all inside the Excel sheet to calculate. Okay. Thank you very much uh -huh. for your answer, uh, Mr. Prakash. Okay, so we can now, if we have no other questions, we can now pass to the second presentation today, um, which is titled The Impact of Green Orientation of Human Resource Management on Employee Green Performance, The Mediating Role of Green Organizational Citizenship Behavior. And it is presented by uh, Vikash Mandal from India. I can see uh, him. So please, Vikash, Share your, share your screen uh, if you are able. You are muted now. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can see and hear you. Please carry on. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, myself, Bikas Mandi, and I am a research scholar from Department of Management Studies in IT Dogapur. And uh, today I am here to give the presentation uh, on the topic of impact of green orientation of human resource management on employee green performance, the mediating role of green organization citizenship behavior. This particular paper has been co-authored by Dr. Dogapur. He is an associate professor of Department of Management Studies, National Institute of Technology, Dogapur, India. So let's move to the introduction slide. So if we are considering in the 21st century, the Sustainability is a critical concern for uh, both the organization, uh, for the society, and for the environment. And if you are talking about the significant issues related to environment, uh, like the global warming, pollution, etc., and ozone layer depletion, loss of biodiversity, and deforestation mitigation. So, industry actually in the Indian context, the industry production has grown more than the 50 fold uh, over a uh, past centuries. So, according to the report from the Central Pollution Control Board India, about the 77% of the industries contribute to the water pollution, while 15% from the air pollution are remaining 8% to the both and air and water pollution. And if you uh, see the CO2 emission rate, uh, so India is in uh, third number, because first in China and second in UK, at the third in uh, uh, India. So it's a critical concern for the uh, government too, that we have to mitigate this carbon emission rate and try to uh, utilize a sustainable use of the resources so here uh, the main thing is the green sustainable practices persist because uh, these particular practices can reduce the carbon emission rate and promote the sustainable use of the resources therefore uh, the, the our uh, study's main objective is to incorporate incorporating the green practices in the different functional areas of human resource management that's we have talked about the green orientations of human resource management where we are trying to uh, orient uh, uh, the green practices in different HR functions like recruitment selection, performance appraisal, uh, training and development, etc. So the purpose of this study is to analyze the impact of green orientation on different functional areas of human resource management on employee green performance uh, on the job with the mediating effect of green organization citizenship behavior. But the green organization citizenship behavior is basically uh, talks about uh, uh, the voluntary behavior shown by the employees without expecting any reward uh, because that particular behavior is related for the environment uh, the significance is uh, significance of the present research paper is to uh, how this GOHR and GOCB and employee green profession can play a crucial role in organization 
to make the organization green and their people green or the employees green. Next, the objective of the studies to study the impact of the green orientation of human resource management on employee green performance. And employee green, green performance has been divided into two broad areas one is the individual, another is the team level. And to study the impact of green orientation of human resource management in promotion of green organizations' resiliency behavior of the employee. And the third objective is to study the mediation effect of green organizations' resiliency behavior on green orientation of human resource management and employee green performance on the job in both the individual and team level. Uh, now, the research framework and the research propositions. Uh, so, basically, uh, this particular framework is compiled by the author themselves. Uh, so here we uh, basically try to explore the relationship between the green orientation of SRM with the direct effect of the employee green performance with both the individual and team level with the mediating effect of GOC. And the theory we have utilized is conservation of the resource theory based on the belief that the people with the many resources are most likely to adopt the proactive resource acquisition technique and invest their present resources in activities that can go above and beyond fundamental requirement as a strategy for sustainable use of the resources. Now the uh, research methodology, the simple subject, the participants of the present study has represent from public sector manufacturing firm located in West Bengal, India. The sample size, uh, initially 250 questionnaire were distributed initially uh, uh, among the employees belonging to the organization. And only after filtering it out, uh, only 223 filled in questionnaire were analyzed for further processing with respect to the current study. The simple unit, uh, the public sector uh, manufacturing organization, namely Damodar Valley Corporation, DBC, uh, considered as a sample unit for this study. And sampling technique, we have uh, you have we have utilized the stratified random sampling to collect the data, where we have taken a strata from according to the different level of management, like uh, operational level, executive level, and managerial level. And tools used, a uh, standardized questionnaire has been uh, administered to collect the data. So GOHRM, Green Orientation of Human Resource Management, has been measured by 16 item scale that has been adopted uh, from the conceptual work of Saha 2019. Uh, and the GOCB uh, measured by using the adapted scale, uh, 13 item adapted scale uh, questionnaire constructed by Boyle and Pele. And GOCB uh, uh, and green employee, uh, employee green performance uh, has been measured by 20 item questionnaire is constructed by the present researcher where 10 items related to the individual level green employee performance and 10 items related to the uh, team level employee green, uh, employee green performance. And the, uh, the scale has been utilized by the Likert four, uh, five point scales where one is for the strongly disagree and five for the strongly agree. And statistical tools used primarily, we have conducted the exploratory factor analysis as we have developed a scale on employee green performance. And uh, after that, Cronberg Alpha has been checked for taking the reliability. And furthermore, the regression analysis has been used. As, and subsequently, we have used Hairs process macro, uh, Hairs process macro to analyze the mediation effect of this particular study. Now, the hypothesis. Uh, uh, the HA, the green orientation of human resource management has a significant positive impact on individual level. And the same way H1B, it's having the impact on team level employee unit performance. H2, having the green orientation of human resource management has a significant positive impact on green organization's regency behavior. H3, having green or, um, organization's regency behavior has a significant positive impact on individual level green employee performance. And H3B, having same with a team level employee green performance. H4A, green organization agency behavior mediates the relationship between the green orientation of human resource management and individual level employee green performance. And the same way H4B is mediating the uh, role of the green orientations with the team level employee green performance. Next, move to the demographic details and the reliability. If you're seeing the demographic details, the gender, uh, the male having the highest uh, frequency and the highest percentage, like 58.6%, and age. Uh, the age having uh, 21 to 25 years has been the highest rate is 147. Its uh, percentage is 65.9 percent, and uh, subsequently we can see all the values. So I'm not giving the uh, detail on that. Uh, if you talk about the designation, as we have stratified, uh, we have done the stratified sampling as per the designation. So operational level having the highest level, highest number of the frequencies is 53.4 percent. 
executive level 96 percent uh, 90 uh, frequency 96 and 43 percent is that and then so on and so forth so now the, if you talk about the experience so one to four year experience people are having 115 that is 51.6 percent and so on and so forth and if you talk about the income level of that particular employees so uh, the highest number uh, highest frequency is 50 51k to 70k is 109 is 48 percent of the total so this is the demographic details uh, the result from the Cronbeck alpha test has been run for the reliability if you see the Cronbeck alpha values it's from 9 9.10 9.52 uh, 0.904 0.832 uh, so average is uh, coming around 8 point something so it's a good indicator that uh, our data having the good reliability our construct having the good reliability next the result from the exploratory factor analysis we have run the exploratory factor analysis for the employee green performance as we have developed our questionnaire so uh, the employee uh, green performance uh, the efa result has been separated by two one is the individual level another was the team level so individual level so we have constructed 10 items uh, from the three dimensions so here we have a, a, a three uh, three factors we got a three factor for after uh, running the exploratory factor analysis so here we have uh, removed uh, two items from uh, individual level as due to the low factor loading and low correlation with that particular construct uh, so our other loadings are very good its loading is uh, above 0 0.7 and if you talk about the team level egp it's the factor loadings are also good and here we have removed one item it's called tgp1 uh, that particular factor yeah. are having the low loading and having a low correlation with that particular construct and if you talk about the kmo bartlow test it's also good is 0.879 and if you take about the chi square test also significant so it's having the valid result for the exploratory factor analysis next with the hypothesis testing if you see the result of the regression weights of the uh, different hypothesis we have already discussed if you talk about the h1a if the r square values is 19 uh, uh, the variance explained is 19.5% uh, and the beta value is 0 0.332 and if p value is 0 0.001 it's uh, the hypothesis is supported it's having the positive the alternate hypothesis is supported it's having a positive relationship with the green employee performance hb having the same uh, having the r square value is uh, the variance total variance explains is 27.2 percent and the p value is 0 0.002 and the hypothesis is supported it's having the positive impact on an employee uh, green performance at the team level and h2e gohrm and gocv it's also having the r square value is 52 percent as variance explained and beta value is 0 0.750 and p value is also 0 0.000 it's also significant h3a gocv and igp individual level green performance it's also having the significant relationship and h3b subsequently also having the significant relationship so overall uh, we have seen that the each of the hypothesis we have constructed having the significant relationship either uh, with each other so it's having the positive signs that if you having uh, if an organization is try to orient his hr function uh, into the dif uh, different aspects of the environmental uh, environmental aspects then it having some significant result on the sustainable use of the resources now the mediation analysis so the mediation analysis we have already talked about the, the mediation the gocb green organization citizens behavior uh, playing a mediating role between the uh, green orientation of human resource management and employee green performance at both individual and team level here we are seeing that uh, uh, the total effect and direct effects are significant and they are partially mediating with each other this is not full mediation this is a partial mediation with because the effects is going from GOHRM, some of the effect directly going to GOHRM to a green employee performance, individual and team level, and some of the effects are coming from uh, GOHRM to uh, GOCB. Yes, it's called green or as a citizenship behavior, and then it's coming to uh, uh, employee green performance, both individual and team level. That's why it's called partial mediating the relationship, not the full mediation. Now the conclusion of this uh, present study has investigated the relationship between the GOHRM and EGP at work. Uh, and the role of GOCB as a mediator. So overall finding uh, indicates the significant impact of the GOHRM on increasing the EGP both individual and team level. Additionally, our study also highlighted the significance of GOHRM which may be utilized in changing the attitude 
and enhancing the voluntary employee participation in different environmental activities which can further increase the organization environment performance and environment that can also increase the environment sustainability so furthermore the effective implementation of green water practices may increase the organization environment performance and increase the sustainable use of organization so at last we can uh, try to conclude that it is impossible to make an organization green without making its people green if any organization try to uh, uh, make an organization green then first they have to start with human resource uh, they have to start greening the human resource because human resource is the important assets which we have to first green then only we can actually green the organization the limitation and future recommendation even though this study is the cross sectional in nature so longitudinal study can be in future can give a conclusive result and it could be advantageous uh, the data here the data has been collected only for the public sector manufacturing organization for future research studies the private sector manufacturing studies uh, private sector manufacturing sector service sector and non performing non profit organization uh, should be considered uh, uh, as a sample unit and present study uh, study, uh, study consider four GOHRM practices, namely green recruitment and selection, green training and development, green performance management, green compensation management. So uh, uh, therefore, the other dimensions like green job description, green organization culture, uh, green employee empowerment, green health and safety management may be considered for the future studies. And uh, here uh, we have only uh, considered one mediator for that. So we can, uh, in future studies, we can uh, include uh, the different cluster of moderator and mediators such as green value, employee commitment, proactive personality, mindfulness, workplace, happiness. So this could be a new perspective on that, can add a new value in the future research. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vikash. Thank you, Vikash, for your uh, presentation. We uh, already have a question from Alessandra Cantini from the University of Florence. Uh, she says, given the key role of green organizational human resource management, what practical strategies do you think companies should adopt to encourage employees to have a greener and more sustainable behavior, both at an individual and at team level? That's a very good question. I think uh, one of the green uh, uh, green or uh, organization human resource management practices, if you talk about the green training and development, uh, where we can actually train the employees toward the most sustainable practices, where we try to aware, we increase the awareness level of the employees through giving or through incorporating the different training sessions, which can lead to a sustainable development. Like, just like, uh, for example, uh, for training related to recycling the product, training related to reusing the product. So this could be a, a, a good indicator or you can uh, use a sustainable use of the resources. In the same time, if the other functional areas like green recruitment and selection, if you take uh, consideration like green, when we are selecting the employees for the organization, then try to select those employees who having a, uh, who having a minimum level or minimum standard of environment awareness. So then only you can select the, so who can meet the green goals of the organization. Then only we can select the employees so that it can improve both the individual and team level. Okay, thank you, thank you. The second question is also from Alessandra. Uh, can you tell us more about the possible interesting uh, future development that you have proposed for this work? Uh, I think uh, this uh, this work I have done this particular work in public sector uh, enterprises. I think uh, we can done uh, into uh, uh, other different sector like manufacturing sector, service sector, uh, like NGOs, and we can also uh, run a comparative study to uh, uh, make a more conclusive result on that. So we can have the uh, future prospect on that. Okay, thank you very much, Vikash. Thank you for your uh, presentation. We can now pass to the next. Uh, presenter, who is Alessandra Cantini from the University of Florence, um, and will present a paper titled A Methodological Framework to Assess Investments in Automatic Storage System for Lightweight Load Units. Please, Alessandra, yes, good morning. you can share your screen. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. So We can hear and see your screen now. Perfect. Um, good morning. I am Alessandra Cantini from the University of Florence, and today I will present the work Practical Guidelines for Evaluating Investments in Automatic Storage Systems for Lightweight Load Units. 
Besides me, the other authors of this study are Saverio Ferraro, Leonardo Leoni, and Filippo De Carlo. In the era or of 4.0 industrial revolution, a good strategy to improve the performance of warehouse logistics is to replace manual storage and retrieval systems with the automated ones. In particular, the best candidates for automation of warehouses are those, the, those warehouses of conventional products uh, with lightweight load units with large and variable daily order volumes, where an automated storage and retrieval system usually produces a better use of time, space, equipment and staff, as well as flexibility against demand variation and an increased inventory accuracy. However, the companies currently struggle to evaluate the convenience of switching from manual storage systems to the automated ones, since many different key performance indicators need to be analyzed and it is not clear what are the most important ones. Many different types of automated storage and retrieval systems exist which have to be compared. And also there is the need to respect company targets and constraints and of course to improve the manual system to be substituted. Despite the interest of companies toward investing in uh, automated storage and retrieval systems, the literature in this field is uh, um, still scarce and only two research streams can be identified. The first research streams regards the reviews and qualitative discussions on what automated storage and retrieval system types exist together with their advantages and disadvantages. And here we can, understand, we can see uh, four main types, which are the load-based, the boat-based, and the carousel-based systems, as well as the vertical lift modules. The second research stream, uh, whereas, uh, regards the, the proposal of simulation or analytical-based models to optimize the design of a specific type of automated storage and retrieval system. But usually they do not compare this type of storage system with others. So it's difficult to perform an investment evaluation. So based on these, the literature currently lacks guidelines and methodologies to support strategic decisions on what are the most appropriate automated storage and retrieval systems to uh, install in, in different companies, and what also are the sizing models to be adopted for designing those types of systems. Given these gaps, evaluating investments in automated storage and retrieval systems for lightweight load units is a complex and time-consuming task, and this uh, prevents companies in uh, uh, performing a transition towards 4.0 warehouses. Indeed, as I said, many different types of warehouses have to be evaluated, and it is not clear what KPIs to assess. Many sizing models uh, can, are, are, available, are available and companies should select one of them based on experience. And also uh, a specific sizing model for, uh, should be adopted for each individual um, storage system to be designed. So based on this, this study uh, aimed at putting together the existing indications by literature, then deriving a novel methodological framework to support investment evaluation in automated storage systems and retrieval systems for lightweight load units. The methodological framework is composed of six procedural steps and it involves analyzing both operational and economic key performance indicators. And step one, the plethora of existing automated storage and retrieval system types for lightweight load units is understood. And to this end, a list was provided after consulting the literature, but focusing on lightweight load systems. Uh, and then in step two, the design space has to be narrowed down since this helps in saving costs and time efforts in the evaluation in the next steps. And to this end, a diagram was built, which represents one of the main contributions of this study. Uh, since by consulting the suppliers' portfolios of automated storage and retrieval systems and, and understanding their average speed and capacity, and also putting together this information with the two uh, key performance indicators that uh, Dairpur et al. suggests as the main ones at an operational level to be evaluated when considering investments, then we achieved this diagram. And here you can see that based on the numbers of rows uh, that the company uh, average perform in an hour, which are the transactions, the hourly transactions, and the number of references managed by the company, then we can understand what are the required throughput and the required capacity of the warehouse that the company wants to achieve and understand what are the automated storage and retrieval systems which are compatible by, uh, with uh, performing and providing these uh, uh, targets, KPIs. 
Then in step three, the company constraints are gathered since uh, space limitations and company and cost limitations of the company uh, should uh, enable or inhibit specific types of automated storage and retrieval systems. Then in step four, each promising remaining automated storage and retrieval system uh, has to be sized since this um, allows uh, achieving an accurate assessment of operational KPIs. And to this end, uh, a diagram was provided not only to summarize the existing sizing models methodologies, but also to suggest a preference order uh, for these methodologies to be selected, uh, aiming to find a trade-off between the level of detail reached in designing uh, the warehouse system and the computational effort required in a strategic evaluation, which is not a tactic one. So in this regard, the simulation-based models seems not a good idea since they are too detailed for performing a strategic investment evaluation. Then analytical models should be preferred, uh, but the linear and mixed integer programming models are reported to usually don't consider the stochasticity of warehouses. Uh, moreover, the travel time models are reported to usually don't, do not consider the uh, relationship among resources inside the warehouse. So then we suggest as first selection to opt for the queuing network models with a preference on the semi-open ones, which allow both considering the waiting times inside the system and eventual constraints. Then in step five, an operational evaluation of each sized automated storage and retrieval system has to be provided. And in this regard, we provided in this methodological framework a, a diagram to guide this procedure. Uh, ensuring to meet both operational targets of the companies and, state and space constraints and also to perform better than the initial manual storage and retrieval system. And finally, in step five, in step six, an economic evaluation of the remaining solutions is performed, again, providing a diagram to guide this procedure. Um, in this, in this um, diagram, we ensure to respect the company cost constraints and also to ensure satisfactory return investment, net present value and payback period. This methodological framework was applied and tested on a case study, and the case study was the warehouse of an electrical material and distribution company. Uh, and first of all, we used the linear regression technique to forecast the demand and the warehouse of occupation trends. And as you can see in red, the problem was that, that emerged was that the annual saturation level of the warehouses uh, are supposed to soon exceed 100%, meaning that the current manual storage and retrieval system is not capable to cope with demand growth. And this uh, results in the need to replace current manual storage and retrieval system, evaluating investments maybe in automated storage and retrieval systems for lightweight load units. Moreover, by consulting the company database, we were able to understand the two main operational target KPIs, which are the number of references to be managed and the number of hourly transactions. So after collecting the information in step one on the existing um, storage systems and the main operational targets, then we, in step two, we consulted the diagram. Uh, and as you can see from the red star, this represents the company location inside the diagram. Uh, and here you can understand the importance of this diagram, since as you can see, only one, the aisle-based shuttle system, only one system was underlined as capable of providing to the company the number of references and the number of hourly transactions, except, of course, the manual storage and retrieval system. So uh, by consulting this diagram, from the very early stage of this methodological framework, the company was able to understand what, which is the automated storage and retrieval system, which is more capable of uh, representing a solution with strong potential for success. Conversely, by not consulting this diagram, the company would have uh, um, under, uh, performed many different investment evaluation in different types of storage systems, for example, the carousels or the mini loads. But this would have resulted in a very complex and time-consuming procedure without resulting in a favorable investment. Then in step three, the company constraints were collected, resulting in a budget limit, a maximum height and length for the warehouse. And also the company asked us to opt for a tier captive aisle based shuttle. So this is the structure which is here summarized and depicted on the right. And also we um, consulted the database and the company staff to understand the several input parameters for then uh, dimensioning and sizing this, this uh, kind of structure. 
Then in step four, uh, aiming to size the facility, the, the warehouse, uh, we first followed the preference order for selecting the methodologies. We searched for semi-open queuing network models in the literature, but we didn't find any of them to uh, size the, the aisle-based shuttle systems. Uh, moreover, we also find we also find that uh, no closed queuing network models are available again for this type of storage system. So then, following the preference order, we opted for the open queuing network models, and specifically those uh, that by Eder et al. 2020. We are not interested in discussing uh, um, this methodology now, but it is worth to mention that uh, by applying this methodology, the four solutions on the right were achieved by minimizing different objective functions. And in step five, the bold one, the bold solution, which is here uh, represented in red, was selected as the optimal one by the company, since it allows to minimize the footprint of the warehouse and also uh, to reduce the total cost of the solution. So the only uh, solution achieved at the end was uh, submitted for an economic analysis, and this resulted not only in the respect of the company budget, but also in, a, in an advantageous investment. So this result um, shows that uh, the evaluation effort, the investment evaluation effort was minimized since only two days of work were required to achieve this final warehouse solution. And since this solution uh, shows a strong potential for success, this means that this worth to be um, analyzed in detail and it worth to validate the results achieved with this methodological framework. So we performed a discrete event simulation for this kind of facility and the results of the simulation confirmed those by the methodological framework with a mean square error of only 0.98%. So to conclude this presentation, uh, as a remark, um, we can say that we provided a very easy six-step methodological framework to support companies in systematizing and streamlining the investment evaluation in automated storage and retrieval systems for lightweight load units. We also provided indications on which operational and economic KPIs uh, uh, the company should evaluate and what sizing models uh, it should prefer when performing this investment evaluation. So we are supposed to encourage companies in performing this kind of uh, investment evaluation. And then uh, we minimize the complexity and time efforts of this uh, investment evaluation, limiting the detailed uh, evaluation analysis only to the most promising solutions, then uh, uh, aiming to uh, seeking to promote a transition towards 4.0 warehouses. And finally, to conclude, as future developments of this work, I suggest using another case study to further confirm the effectiveness of the methodological framework and also to compare the operational and economic key performance indicators and computational efforts of the warehouse solution achieved by applying the methodological framework with those achieved by not restricting the design space and not adopting the methodological framework. This for sure will uh, be useful to ensure that the methodolog methodological framework do not exclude uh, valuable investment solutions. This is the bibliography used in the presentation. Thank you very much for the attention. Okay, thank you, Alessandra, for this very nice and clear presentation. We have a question from Fiorenza Sternoni who asks, has the case study company executed the suggested investment? If yes, has it led to the expected results? Oh, thank you very much for this uh, interesting question. Yes, uh, the company is currently applying uh, this uh, suggested investment. Um, it is a long procedure, so it has not finished yet. But up to now, the results achieved um, are satisfactory and confirm the results of the, of the study. So this is... Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alessandra. I think we have no further questions. I cannot see. So thank you again. And we can pass to the next uh, presentation. Uh, there is a change in the scheduling because now it was the time for Giampaolo Di Bona, but we have switched uh, to another paper. So Giampaolo will present in one hour. Now uh, the paper 9392 will be presented. Uh, the title is Developing a Framework to Improve the Production Performance in a Small or Medium Enterprise Through the Introduction of Lean Practices from Leonardo Leone from the University of Florence. Please, Leonardo, share your screen and uh, go. Thank you, Mario. You should be able to see my screen yes, right now. Yes, we can All see right. and hear you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hello everyone, I am Leonardo Leoni and I'm going to present the paper entitled Developing a Framework to Improve the Production Performance in a Small or Medium Enterprise through the Introduction of Lean Practices. The other co-authors are Alessandra Cantini, Saverio Ferraro and Filippo De Carlo, who are all from the University of Florence as well. A luxury product can be defined as a good with distinguishable characteristics, uh, usually associated with excellence. Within this context, uh, uh, the luxury fashion industry plays a pivotal role since uh, up to now, in 2022, it generated 97 billion US dollars. Most of the companies operating uh, in the luxury fashion industry are regarded as small or medium enterprises since uh, their number of employees is lower than 250, while this, their gross income is below 50 million euros. The companies operating in the luxury fashion industry have to face uh, several challenges, such as uh, high volatility and low predictability of the market, short life cycle of products and high impulse uh, purchase of the customers. Furthermore, they have to balance the trade-off between the performance and the stylistic process. Moreover, since uh, most companies are small and medium enterprises, they have other challenges th uh, that they should face, such as increase of customer needs, globalization, e-commerce birth, and resistance to change. For all these reasons, uh, most of the companies in the luxury fashion industries are characterized by high inefficiency and inability to meet dates. Uh, however, the majority of works related to luxury, small and medium enterprises are just focusing on the critical success factors related to luxury products, such as premium quality, craftsmanship, and exclusivity. This is related to the nature of uh, luxury products. However, since uh, they are mainly inefficient, they should also focus on uh, organizational and operative aspects. A possible way to improve the efficiency is adopting lean practices. Indeed, lean has as a main goal the meet, the meet of the customer needs through a progressive removal of waste. As a matter of fact, lean has been proven to assist in pursuing higher efficiency and cost reduction. However, its implementation is not straightforward so each company should understand which is the best way to adopt lean practices based on uh, its needs and requirements. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are few implementations uh, uh, related to the lean uh, uh, practices in uh, small and medium enterprises. And uh, indeed, most uh, of the implementations of uh, lean practices uh, in, uh, small, in uh, luxury companies are related to big enterprises. Based on these considerations, the main objective of this uh, paper is to develop a framework to gently introduce the lean practices in a small or medium enterprise operating in the luxury fashion industry. After this uh, brief introduction, the presentation will follow the outline shown in this slide. So at first, the developed methodology will be presented along with the, uh, its application to a case study, so the results. Then the discussion will be illustrated and finally the conclusion along with the possible future developments that will be drawn. It is important to mention that uh, the developed methodology is just one feasible solution to adopt uh, uh, lean practices. So as previously mentioned, there is not a single solution. Indeed, lean has many tools, so it is required to define the ones that should be adopted and in which order. So this uh, methodology is one possible approach. The methodology is composed of three subsequent stages. The first one is the preliminary analysis, which uh, consists uh, of uh, team building, measure as its performance, and key performance indicator definition. As a matter of fact, it is required to understand which uh, are, which is the actual performance of the, of the plan, of the company, understand what can be improved and what uh, are the company, uh, company's needs. Then there is uh, the true application of lean tools. So at first, a uh, new daily production plan is implemented. Then the waste reduction is uh, uh, conducted through the first 3S, typical of the 5Ss of lean. And uh, then a new layout is defined. And finally, the production line is started. 
The layout is defined after the waste reduction. Indeed, the waste reduction is uh, uh, used to remove useless tool and equipment. So uh, it is required to understand which are the tools that are, are necessary for the process. If the layout would have been defined before, the, the useless tool would have been maintained even in the new layout. Then finally, the third stage is measuring the results and standardization. So measure the to be performance to understand uh, the benefits that uh, arise from the application of lean tools. And then there is the standardization, uh, which consists in the application of the last 2S of typical of the 5S of lean practices. So these can be uh, included in a context of continuous improvement. It is important to mention that the standardization has to follow every other phases since uh, the, uh, it's important to verify which are the benefits. So what has worked and then implement them, maintain it, uh, and maybe ex exploit it for other phases or departments. To demonstrate the validity and applicability of the developed uh, framework, uh, a luxury fashion bag industry uh, company was chosen as a case study. So the company was, is characterized by a number of employees below 250 and a gross income below 50 million euros. So it can be identified as a medium enterprise. Only one department was considered at first. So at first, uh, the preliminary analysis starts with the team building. So the employees, the employees that uh, are in charge of the change, uh, changes uh, were identified and tasks were, were assigned to each of them. Then a team leader was defined as well to uh, guide the group uh, in the changing process. Then the, me the measurement of the ASIS performance is conducted. To accomplish this task, a spaghetti chart was drawn and uh, it emerged that 40% of the available space was occupied by machines. And in the remaining 60% of space, uh, there were many obstacles that uh, made the movements of the operators uh, very difficult. As a matter of fact, the operators had to walk uh, more than one kilometer to perform their uh, job. So the key performance indicators were later defined based on the needs and on the improvements that uh, are, are arise from the previous analysis. Indeed, the, companies, the company was uh, highly inefficient and uh, the space, uh, space usage was also inefficient. So the KPIs were defined to uh, target these two uh, aspects, so space occupancy and productivity. Uh, uh, moreover, the target improvement uh, were defined for which uh, uh, identified the key performance indicator. Then the application of lean tools uh, begins with the definition of a new daily production plan through the a Junka box and a Kanban system. This allowed to uh, identify the daily objectives and the um, late orders, so which were marked through red stickers. So, it was important to uh, highlight uh, what has gone wrong, what can go wrong, and what could be done to uh, improve what has gone wrong. Then the first uh, three S's are applied. So SERI, useless tools were removed. Useless tools and equipment were first identified and removed from the working area. Then the workers were informed uh, of the tools that uh, were removed. And finally, with the Cyton, and finally with SEZO, the uh, dirt uh, sources were identified and associated with the uh, uh, employees that were in charge of removing the dirt source. Then the a new layout uh, was uh, defined based on uh, some information uh, and specifically after, after the defining uh, uh, the tasks required to uh, produce an item and uh, uh, as, well, after associating uh, each uh, task with uh, either a machine or a workstation. Uh, to conclude the second stage, the production line has been started and it can be seen from the to be spaghetti chart that uh, the flow compared to the previous one was uh, much more organized and linear. Uh, indeed, the new layout was uh, much more um, compact, so it uh, required uh, less space and the flow was uh, uh, more linear. 
Then D2B performance uh, was measured uh, through the key performance uh, indicators that uh, uh, were previously defined and the target improvement uh, uh, of each uh, working, uh, uh, which uh, key performance indicator was compared with the real improvement, the improvement that was achieved. It can be seen that all the improvements uh, are reached. Finally, with the last two S's, so Seiketsu and Shitsuke, the uh, practices that uh, have worked were standardized and uh, made, uh, they were made uh, permanent. So uh, the company could uh, exploit uh, what has worked in other departments. To investigate the results uh, even further, the tasks performed by an operator were uh, analyzed and divided into five different categories. From this analysis uh, uh, emerged that uh, the value added task uh, accounted for 63% of the total working time, while only 20% uh, of the tasks are related to extra processing on or non value added tasks. So basically, the um, if layout uh, was very effective to improve the efficiency of the uh, operator. Moreover, the productivity was analyzed through, the, uh, through 14 days of production uh, up and uh, three different items. And it can be seen that the, for the third item, which uh, was produced for a longer period, the productivity reached a, a very high level. So it can be stated that uh, for the uh, pro prolonged production, the productivity improves uh, much more compared to uh, short uh, or smaller batches. To conclude this presentation about a framework to implement lean practices within uh, a luxury small or medium enterprise, it, can, it is possible to state that uh, the target KPIs were reached. So higher production volume, high pro higher productivity, and a better space occupancy. Regarding the limitations and possible future developments, uh, uh, it is possible to state that one uh, a uh, feasible option could be implementing continuous improvement practices till the decommissioning of the plant. Uh, moreover, it is possible to test the framework on different case studies to understand whether uh, its, uh, uh, its generalizability and uh, it, whether it can be, be effective even in uh, other contexts. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Leonardo, for your very interesting uh, presentation. We have a question from uh, Sebastiano del Guzzo from the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, who asks how the drawing of the, of the spaghetti chart was conducted. Oh, all right. So thank you, Sebastiano, for your question. So basically, the, there was an operator uh, with a floor plan that was in charge of tracking down the movements uh, of the operators that uh, were working on the machines or on the working stations. And uh, he, the operator was in charge of tracking every movement. So he was uh, there following the, uh, the employees that uh, were in, on, in the working stations and uh, tracking down on, on, a, on a map, on a, on, the, on a paper. And uh, that's it, basically. So. Uh, the map was reporting every machines and every uh, working station, and so the flow was very realistic, since uh, the map was, uh, I mean, uh, was uh, reproducing the real layout environment. And this was conducted before the layout planning and after the, the, the new layout planning. So the comparison was also uh, useful from a um, view perspective, since you can see the differences on a map. Uh, before and after the implementation of a new layout. Okay, thank you very much, Leonardo. I think we have no further yeah. questions. So we can pass to the next presenter, who is uh, Atmane Badda from the National School of Business and Management, uh, El Jadida. I don't know if, yeah, now I can see, I can see you. You are muted, Atmane. Okay, are you able to share your screen? No, no. No, okay, so we have to send the, the video. Okay, yes. uh, no problem. Stay stay connected for the question and answer ses session in 12 of minutes. Course. Okay, the title is The Impact of the Complexity of Information Systems on User Performance. Exactly. Thank you. 
hello everyone i'm atman beta and i will present to you our communication entitled the impact of complexity of information systems on user performance under the supervision of mr rahmoni our communication will follow this plan an introduction the problem and research objectives the literature review the research methodology the, uh, the results and the conclusion in the current context, the turbulent business environment is known by an increasing complexity and there the influence of technical and economical conditions. In this context, the emergence of information systems seems to have a major impact on the development and, and success of organizations. And with the crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic, the organizations have converted to remote working and they have more digitized their procedures what pushed companies to massively adopt information systems where our problem originated in the area of the covid 19 crisis and the adoption of information systems to what degree do the complexity of information system adopted contributes to the performance of their users so the objectives of our research is to assess the influence of the degree of complexity of information systems on the frequency of their use and to examine the impact of, he, of this frequency on the overwork performance on information system users. As we know, not all companies have the same information needs. Some more than others need the timely and reliable information to make decisions. Morris and Ewing, based on the life circle theory of the firm, shows that organizations passing through different stages of development have different conceptions of information systems. Davila shows that the past and the history of events that have marked the management practices of the company provides time for the organization to learn, improve, and make, it, make its information systems more complex. Abdel Kader and Luther proves that more the size of the company grows, the more resources and skills it will have to make its information system more complex. Alumiri and Drury also shows that having a management control who masters management accounting impacts the degree of complexity of the information systems. From the above, we formulate our first hypothesis the, the degree of complexity of information systems influences the, fr the frequency of their use. Devaraj and Kohli show that information systems offer managers the possibility of monitoring in real time the management of their businesses and activities, but the investments in information technology infrastructure alone cannot have an impact on work performance without strengthening the degree of connection between human technology and organization. Brangier and Al proves that the adoption of information system allows operational managers to be more efficient by collecting and processing data more frequently and in short time in order to be able to analyze and ensure an adequate link between local objectives and the overall performance of the company. This allows information asymmetry in large groups that have adopted an external growth strategy. So in order to assess the impact of the frequency of use of information systems on the performance of, of users, we were inspired by the technology acceptance model, which is considered one of the most widely used theoretical models in information systems research. The TAM model identifies two determinants in the attitude and intention of users to accept the technology, the, the perceived usefulness and the perceived ease of use. From the above, we formulate our second hypothesis, the frequency of use of information systems impact the performance of their users. So we can design our research model deduced from our literature review and hypothesis as follow. So to test the hypothesis of our research, we conduct a questionnaire survey. It was sent to manage to management controls in the region of Rabasali Kinitra in the Kingdom of Morocco. 
of the 108 questionnaire administrated uh, 72 was returned and only 49 of them uh, ultimately proves usable to analyze our results we proceed by analysis of descriptive data by the sps software and in order to confirm of or refuse our research hypothesis we related on the key score independence test our results shows that with a key score value of 11.93 and a significance of 0 0.018 the relationship between the perception of the degree of flexibility of the information systems and the frequency uh, of its use is significant so as the influence of the perception at the level of feature quality of the information system on the frequency of their use is very significant with a key score value of 32.41 and a significance of zero also with a significance of zero the influence of the perception at the level of output quality of the information systems on the frequency of their use turn, turn out to be very significant from this analysis and basing on the results of the key score tests we can then confirm our first research hypothesis and say that the perception of the degree of complexity of the information systems impacts the frequency of use the results also prove with a key score value of 52.29 and a significance of zero the, re the relationship between the frequency of use of the information system on the improvement in the degree of speed of work is very significant so as the influence of the frequency of use of the information system on the improvement of work productivity turns out to be very significant with a key score value of uh, 39.80 and a significance of zero however the relationship between the perception of the improvement in the ease of responding to work needs and the frequency of use does not prove to be significant with a significance of a 0 0.15 from this analysis we did use that the frequency of use of information systems influences in a limited way the performance of their users and we can then partially confirm our second second research hypothesis Shen Hal shows that the usage and satisfaction influence each other and are jointly de determined by the quality of the information and the quality of the system our res research proves the impact of perceived usefulness and perceived ease of use and acceptance of information systems by management controllers which reinforces the TAM model Lopez and Al proves that the COVID-19 pandemics armed the functioning of supply chains and therefore negatively impact the satisfaction of customer needs so we say the information system is at the heart of value creation any organization is required to monitor and convert its impacts to ensure the performance of the information system users Covindan and al shows that the manufacturing and service sectors may need more new information and communication technologies which will lead to an increase in demand of information systems so we say the adoption of information technology is a strategic tool that allows management controls to improve their performance at work Scapins and Jazairi demonstrate that the use and satisfaction generate their own impacts and can have an individual or organizational form so we say that the impact of the degree of complexity of the information systems on the degree of improve improvement in the work performance of management controls so to conclude the results of our study proved the significant impact of the degree of complexity of the information systems on the frequency of their use and the influence of this frequency of use on the improvement of the user's performance
So beyond these, ah, sorry, beyond these contributions, our study has limitations that open research perspectives and that can be removed by future research. First, our study presents a sample of 39 observation analyzed. It would therefore be interesting to understand the cultural contingency factors in future studies with a large sample. Secondly, taking into account the national aspects of our study, it would be appropriate, appropriate sorry, to verify the relevance of our results in different cultural areas. So these are our references and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Watmane, for this presentation. Uh, I can see you now. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first yes. one from Fiorenza Sarnoni, who asks, having shown that information systems impact the user performance, which are the main practical suggestions you would provide to enhance the overall organizational performance? Uh, so we, uh, our study was uh, focused on the the subjective evaluation of the of the management controls over the the, the impact of the, the information systems. So uh, we we didn't study uh, the impact of this uh, this uh, of this uh, of this uh, this, this uh, the impact of uh, information systems on the the management controls and this impact in or uh, of the organization performance talk. Uh, so this, uh, it would be uh, uh, a complement of this study in, uh, in the future. Uh, so we just uh, focus on uh, our research uh, to, uh, to evaluate the, the impact or uh, the, vision, uh, uh, the vision of uh, the management controls uh, over the, the use or the adoption of the information systems uh, which uh, adopted by, uh, by the companies. Yeah, okay. So in part, you also responded to the second question because uh, Sebastian Bilozzo was asking which are the next steps of this research work concerning user performance in relation to information systems? Yes, it would be uh, like uh, a complement from the, the first question, and uh, also like I I said in my uh, the limits of uh, the the research was the uh, the the use of the comportmental uh, uh, the 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 Cantanji uh, the theory of the the Cantanji uh, comportmental. So we can see the, these results if they can uh, change uh, in another context of uh, in another uh, in another country. Uh, so uh, because our research is, uh, like I said, is uh, national and uh, it's uh, in a de determined uh, uh, geographical uh, area. So we can even uh, test this. Uh, this uh, this study in uh, other areas in uh, in Morocco also, so we can uh, see the the difference of the the culture of uh, because as you know Morocco is a uh, a country which is uh, we have a different uh, we, we will not see culture in in general but uh, in uh, in turn uh, cultures we are some some differences so. We can also test it, and we can also test it in another countries, because, uh, like uh, our study is uh, based our uh, on the evaluation of uh, human, so the, the perceived uh, and uh, usefulness. So uh, we can uh, they can change. Uh, as you know, human uh, they are not uh, they, they we all not see the same thing or not. Uh, yes, uh, yes, sure. That's right. Uh, Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mane. Thank you. Uh, I think there are no other questions. I cannot see from LinkedIn and YouTube. Okay, so thank you, Atman, again. And we can pass to the next presentation, uh, which comes from the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. I don't know if 
Fiorenza Sun, yes, she's with us. Very nice. Yes, good morning. Can you yeah, see me? Good morning. Uh, no, yeah, oh, yes. now yes, now yes. Okay. Very nice. So uh, the title of this presentation is on the relationship between human factor and overall equipment effectiveness evidences from an application of the analytic hierarchy uh, process. So please, Fiorenza, share your screen. Okay, we can see your screen and hear you. Please go on. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Fiorenza Starnoni, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, our study conducted with Sebastiano Di Luozzo and Massimiliano Maria Schiraldi called uh, On the Relationship Between Human Factor and Overall Equipment Effectiveness, Evidences from an Application of the Analytic Hierarchy Process. The overall equipment effectiveness can, uh, is uh, one of the leading key performance uh, uh, indicators for manufacturing uh, operations management aimed uh, at identifying and measuring the inefficiencies of uh, industrial uh, equipment. Along the years, the OE indicator, first introduced by Nagajima in 1988, uh, has become a pillar for continuous uh, improvement in the operations context and uh, is uh, largely adopted by manufacturing uh, organizations. However, despite the wide adoption and implementation of OE, the influence of the human factor on its outcomes has only begun to receive attention during the last decades. Uh, indeed, in recent years, few scientific contributions have investigated the relationship, showing that uh, even if not clearly identified yet, uh, the link between manufacturing performances and human aspects appears uh, relevant. For this reason, the objective of the study is to investigate the relationship between the overall equipment effectiveness and the human factor, with the aim of identifying the human activities that exert an influence on reaching high levels of uh, OE. Uh, to reach this goal, the starting point is represented by the OE uh, definition and description of the uh, background concerning the relationship between OE and the human factor. Second, the identification and classification of the human factors have been uh, proposed. And finally, the human factor identified have been validated through the analytic hierarchy process analysis. The overall equipment effectiveness can be defined as a key performance indicator in uh, I think we have the problem with Fiorenza, who is now frozen. So maybe we can run the video, uh, Sebastiano. From I, I suggest to run the Good video morning, from that everyone. point, from the point she she was arrived. Objective of the study yeah. is okay. to investigate the relationship between the overall equipment effectiveness and the human factor with the aim of identifying the human activities that exert uh, an influence on reaching high levels of uh, OE. To reach this goal, the starting point is uh, represented by the OE definition and the description of the background concerning the relationship between OE and human factor. Second, the identification and classification of human factor has been proposed. And finally, the human factors identified have been validated through the analytic hierarchy uh, process analysis. The overall equipment effectiveness can be defined as a key performance indicator, which involves uh, the aggregation of three different uh, indicators, availability, performance efficiency, and uh, quality rate. In this context, uh, while the attention has originally been paid mainly to the assessment of equipment, uh, machinery, and other tangible factors concerning the manufacturing processes, the investigation of the relationship between human factors and OE uh, has been recognized as a crucial step for the achievement of a competitive advantage. Indeed, uh, as uh, originally stated by Nagajima, even if it's possible to reach a configuration of a plant characterized by a high degree of uh, automation, uh, it will not be possible to eliminate the need that the manpower can generate on the manufacturing uh, outcomes. As reported previously, the relationship between OE and human factor has been analyzed through the literature review uh, with the objective of uh, identifying the main human factors influencing uh, OE values. The analysis therefore focused on articles that both on theoretical and practical basis consider OE in uh, specific production contexts. 
Uh, as a result, uh, 34 articles have been uh, selected for the composition of the dataset. Subsequently, the uh, bibliographic portfolio analysis allows to identify and classify the human factors impacting OE with a hierarchical structure uh, reported uh, in the in slide. It can be possible to identify three different levels of the model. Uh, within the first hierarchical level corresponding to level one, it's possible possible to identify the macro categories of human factors that influence the achievement of high OE values, and this level corresponds to the family of human factors grouped by uh, impacted area. Within the second hierarchical level, it's possible to identify the human factors that influence the values of the performance indicator. And at last, uh, within the third uh, hierarchical level, it's possible uh, to identify the factors that can influence the correct execution of uh, manual uh, activities. As a result, for macro criteria of human factor corresponding to organization and planning of manual activities, definition and execution of standards, quality and procedure, uh, design of production and logistic system, and information management have been uh, identified and 13 human factors have been uh, considered. According to the proposed hierarchical structure, an analytic hierarchy uh, process questionnaire was developed to determine the weight of level 1 and level 2 factors and to determine the relative importance of level 3 elements. For this reason, the survey that has been compiled by the Operation Excellence Think Tank members required to perform first per wide comparison between the level 1 criteria, second per wide comparison between the level 2 criteria, and finally hierarchical ranking of the level 3 criteria. Additionally, each respondent was associated with a specific consistency ratio, allowing to to perform a detailed analysis according to the consistency ratio uh, values. As a result, it's possible to observe that the factors that play a main role in leading to high values of OE are represented by the definitions and execution of standard qualities and procedure and the design of production and logistics uh, systems. Successively, the results for the level two factors are reported in the slide, and for the macro criteria of the organization and planning of manual activities, the main important human factors identified is the proper execution of setup uh, intervention, interventions. In the same way, for the macro criteria of the definition and execution of standard quality and procedure, the main human factor identified is the expertise for conducting uh, operational uh, activities. And for the macro criteria of the design of production logistic systems, uh, the main human factor identified is the proper ergonomics uh, of the operator's uh, workstations. Note that for the level two factors belonging to the information management, the pairwise comparison reported only one question, so the consistency ratio is equal to zero, and the main human factor identified is the accuracy of manual data management. Lastly, the results for the level two factors are shown, and it's possible to observe that for the majority of the level two factors, training and proper illumination are evaluated as the most important elements for improving the OE. These results allow us to state that the personal futures and the soft side of people are considered by the decision makers as very relevant for the achievement of excellence operation performance. The aim of the paper is the identification of the relationship between OE and the human factors. Specifically, the purpose of the study consists in identifying the activities linked to the manpower that affect the OE. Overall, 20 human factors have been identified and organized in a hierarchical structure to better clarify the impact on OE, and four human factors uh, are, um, are, have been selected as the most important human factor affecting the OE. This allows concluding that a strong relationship between the performance indicator and the human factors exists and uh, clearly appears. Uh, the research area, however, appears to be newly explored and the paper could uh, represent the starting point for a deeper analysis. 
Uh, in the future, it may seem appropriate to expand uh, the research uh, for this relationship uh, through studies that could allow the identification of additional uh, human factors. And lastly, it's possible to carry out the same analysis with a wider audience of uh, respondents with the objective of performing uh, a further validation of the results uh, obtained. Thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you Fiorenzo for this presentation. I'm, I'm very sorry, I think you had a problem. Uh, yeah. not, no, no problems. Uh, so we have a question from my colleague, Raffaele Abate, who asks, have the identified human factors been associated with the OEE parameters with their associated impact? Uh, yes, the human factors uh, identified have been firstly uh, identified through the literature review and after have been classified based on uh, availability, performance efficiency and quality rate. Uh, after, we have also uh, evaluated uh, if the impact of uh, the human factor on the uh, OE parameters was uh, uh, positive or uh, negative. So, yes. Okay. Thank you, Fiorenza. I think we have no further questions. So, thank you again for your presentation. And now we can pass to the next presenter, who is Maria Antonietta Turino from the University of Campania, Luigi Mambitelli. Hello, Maria. We can see you. Maria okay. will present... Uh, paper uh, with the title Proposal of a Sustainability Performance Measurement Framework for Human Robot Production System. So please, Maria, share your screen. Okay. We can hear you. And go. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Maria Antonietta Torino from the University of Campania, Luigi Vanvitelli, and I'm here to show you our work about the development of a sustainable performance measurement system uh, for human uh, robot collaborative systems. The presentation is organized as follows. In the section one, introduction and scope of the work are provided. Section two uh, shows the research methodology. Section three presents the proposed framework. And finally, in the section four, are summarized uh, the main implication, limitation, and conclusions. The collaborative activity is a social interaction in which individuals cooperate by performing individual acts to each um, other shared goal that at the same time uh, requires recognition. So it is um, inevitably that there is the coexistence of humans and robots. Now, what is the problem? In their decision-making processes, uh, designers and managers of manufacturing and logistics operations must consider not only traditional economic and environmental aspects, but also social ones. Moreover, in recent decades, as the humanity's awareness of its impact on the world has grown, the concepts of sustainability and sustainable development have also become of fundamental importance within companies. The prospect of seeing a machine, a computer, or uh, even a robot no longer as a servant, but as a collaborator in solving prob problems is in fact one of the most promising frontiers involving the world of robotics. What should not be overlooked is uh, the concept of sustainable development, that is uh, development that meets the needs of the present of the present without compromising the ability of future uh, generations to meet their own needs. Today, uh, sustainable development should embrace three main perspectives, uh, namely economic, environmental, and social sustainability. For a proper implementation of the sustainability concept, it is necessary to identify and assess critical KPIs for uh, production systems in order to have more possibilities for self-assessment and improvement along the three perspectives, which could be achieved by developing an appropriate performance measurement systems. A PMS is defined as a system that allows manager to monitor um, performance indicators related to their products, services and processes inert in the production system over a given period. Performance indicators are defined as a, uh, the criteria against which the performance of products, services, and processes can be evaluated. So, what is the scope of our work? The aim of our work is to create a framework that allows us to measure and evaluate the level of sustainability in a human robot production systems. Why was it specifically chosen to study the sustainable aspects in human robot production systems? 
First of all, because there is a lack of literature on this subject, which is a problem since robots are increasingly present in production system. If we consider that in the last 15 years, the number of robots sold worldwide has increased by 500%, and that the trend will lead uh, towards ever greater automation production processes. It is clear how fundamental it is to ask ourselves how robots will influence the world of work. But at the same time, the company must not forget the weight it has in terms of responsibility, not only economic, but also environmental and social, and therefore the sustainable aspect. How did, arrive, how did we arrive at the framework? First, an initial analysis of a PMS and their application to various industries was carried out, with a specific focus on human-robot collaboration and related KPIs. Then, a mapping of the relevant perspective between economic, environmental, and the social that could be privileged in the creation on the performance measurement system for human robot interaction and the uh, KPI was established. Finally, um, the final proposal of the framework for measuring and evaluating sustainability performance in the human robot collaboration was developed. Okay. As far as PMS is concerned, it was seen that the, that, that is a, a key action to monitor the performance of the industry. At the same time, however, it is important to select which indices are most appropriate for the case. In fact, companies usually make use of many indices, while only those of that are truly captured the sense of the company's performance. KPIs are usually divided into various categories, which allows the company to more easily select interesting indices based on plan, strategic, operational, tactical, tactical and financial, level, height, medium and low, and the subject of the measure, quality, time, cost or flexibility. About human-robot collaborative systems, it, it has been seen that uh, collaborative robotics can offer various economic benefits to industry. But the social aspect and implications of the implementation of the, of the Industry 4.0 paradigm of, um, on uh, human factors have not been enough debated. In fact, new technologies seem to pay more attention to economic factors and thus the impact of collaborative human-robot systems on social sustainability remain an open issue. For uh, economic sustainability, we mean the ability of an economic system to generate income and employment on a sustainable basis. Economic sustainability indicators aim to measure the historical evolution of the company from an economic financial point of view, uh, to project it towards future uh, objectives. The figure shows the KPIs found in the literature to measure the level of economic sustainability. The slide provides the KPIs that have been identified in the literature to measure the environmental sustainability level. By environmental sustainability is meant the set of all good practices aimed to protecting the ecosystem and renewing natural resources. Environmental sustainability and supply chain management can be seen in terms of reducing the ecological impact of industry activity without sacrificing quality, cost, performance, reliability or efficient use of energy through compliance with the environmental regulations. Could this lead to uh, an overall increase in corporate profits? Finally, um, this slide outlines the KPIs found in the literature to measure the level of social sustainability. For social sustainability, we mean the ability to ensure that the human welfare conditions are equitability shared. By combining the findings from the literature about PMS, human-robot collaboration, the metrics for economic, environmental and social perspective, a sustainable framework has been derived. It. For economic sustainability of human-robot collaboration, I propose the production rate, robot utilization efficiency, defined as the ratio between the actual production time and the resource occupation time, operator allocation efficiency, where a comparison is made between the operator's activity work time and the work shift, 
incidence of operating cost per unit and the maintenance cost per year, the, the processing quality, the return on uh, and the return on investment. For environmental aspects are suggested the measurement of electricity consumption and electricity consumption for rework per unit produce, produced. Uh, at last, for uh, indexes below, uh, the indexes below have been uh, proposed to evaluate the social sustainability of human-robot collaboration. The percentage of hours de dedicated to the training relating to knowledge of the robots in terms of robot use and control, the rate of accident at work and the exposure to danger, the amount of time devoted to co-work and to robot attention demand, the work distribution, the amount of energy expended by the worker in carrying out the work activity, and finally the OVAS indexes. So, this study proposed a framework of 17 indices designed to assess the sustainability of the manufacturing system with respect to the three perspectives, economic, environmental and social, within a collaborative human-robot context. What is the scientific contribution? This paper has therefore tried to revisit some of the viable metrics to adapt them to the context of the human-robot collaboration, considering its peculiarities. This paper takes into consideration all the sustainable perspectives and assigns to them the same importance. What about the practical implication? The framework could be implemented in several companies with human-robot collaboration production systems for testing and benchmarking proposed. But uh, the set of indexes proposed should be validated by the uh, opinions of experts working in the human-robot collaboration system. And it is necessary a creation of a composite indicator to move from a fragment description of the state of the enterprise to a comprehensive and total assessment of the sustainability of the production cycle. Uh, many thanks for your attention. Happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for your very nice presentation. We have a question from uh, Sara Van Nebli who asks, do you think that focusing on the social aspect of sustainability can reduce the sense of mistrust and anxiety present in the human-robot coexistence condition? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, well, this is a very important aspect. In fact, uh, human-robot uh, um, collaboration is having a significant impact. Uh, progress can represent a significant opportunity for the collective welfare and it is important to focus the research on social relevant interaction and to stem the dangers. Uh, never before has it been so important to be aware of the ethical implication of a new technology. So, uh, social impact analysis, I believe, can be a case step in alleviating uh, the fears um, present in the humans of uh, being um, assisted by robots. So. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. I think we have no further questions. So thank you again, and we can now recover the presentation from Giampaolo Di Bona from the University of uh, Cassino, who will be the last presenter uh, before the break. I can see you, Giampaolo. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Okay, thank you. you will present a paper uh, with the title New Approach to Evaluate Human Error Probability in a Nuclear Plant. So please share your screen. Okay, we can see okay. your screen and, and uh, hear you. So please carry on. Okay. Okay, thank you for your presentation. I'm Giampaolo Di Bona. I'm an associate professor of University of Cassino and I'd like to talk about our work uh, titled A New Approach to Evaluate uh, Human Error Probability in a Pharmaceutical Plant. In this paper, we propose um, a hybrid model to evaluate uh, human error uh, reliability, uh, probability, called the uh, logic human reliability. Uh, the new approach is based on uh, logic normal distribution, uh, nuclear action reliability assessment method, and the performance shipping factor uh, relationship. Starting from, uh, uh, I think, uh, Oh, okay, yeah. 
Can you see my my slide? Yes. Y yes, yes, we can see you. Yeah, yeah. You and For also your slide. Yeah, yeah. Not prison, no. Yes, okay. we can okay. see okay. your oh, slide. Okay, yeah. that's okay. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, just a moment. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Uh, starting from some shortcoming uh, related to the approach, especially the limitation of the working time, we estimate the performance shipping factor after eight hours of working standard during emerging condition. This hybrid method has been applied and tested in a pharmaceutical accident scenario. Uh, the new method starts from some literature methods. The human internal and environmental external factors that influence the operator's ability are both elaborated in the, the proposed approach. In order to achieve this, uh, first, uh, a literature review of uh, recent uh, articles is necessary. The most relevant methodologies are divided in three different generations. Uh, human error probability is uh, limited to the first eight hours of work. No dependency de between the relationship of performance shipping factor and the failure rate is constant. The, the present research analyzes three different related to the literature method. The proposed model overcome or try to overcome the limitation and merge the uh, advantages of the most conventional human error uh, probability methodology. So uh, the new method is structured in seven steps. Uh, first step is a perimeter analysis. In this phase, we introduce logic function. Why? Logic normal function is selected during wear out phase of the component. This phase can be compared uh, to the stress phase of uh, an operator during an accident scenario. So we have uh, selected the logic distribution to link human error probability and the operating time. The human reabilities has been evaluated by the Geelongshan function of ferro probability, where mu is the average value and sigma is the start, uh, the standard deviation. The, uh, in step two, we define generic tasks that represent the internal factors of the operators. Uh, each generic task follows the logic function, the above for logic function. Using logic distribution, uh, human error probability will be calculated uh, failure rate, mean time to failure, and sigma using the following uh, tables. In step three, we evaluate uh, the basic error probability. But uh, I think it's a problem of uh, equation. Can you see the equation? No, we can only see the number of the equation, but uh, yeah. not the equations. Uh, are you trying to share your slides or your entire screen? Sh uh, slide. So if you try to maybe stop the sharing and try to share your entire screen, if you can, it would be better, maybe. OK, I'm trying. Just a moment. Yes, yes, don't worry. OK, now can see your screen. But Again. not my equations. <laughs> Uh, no, no, not the equations, not the equations. Not the question. Okay. I can try with the PDF files. Just a moment. Don't worry. Don't worry. No, no problem.
Okay. Yeah, now we can okay. see all your Okay, now it's okay. Okay, very nice. It's PDF, okay. PDF is Please carry on, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so, yeah, but step three, yes, okay. Uh, so, in step three, we evaluate the basic error uh, probability influenced by the generic uh, task. Follow the logic distribution. The nominal distribution is theoretical and does not uh, take into account the external environmental factor. A question five considered a working time greater than eight hours because in several emergency, some operator could work even 24 hours consecutive. Uh, then the environmental influencer are modeled with the use of performance shipping factor. The performance shipping factor increases the human error probability values using boring values in the following table. The performance shipping factor correlation value is evaluated from the product of all performance shipping factor. This value represents the external environmental condition. The result obtained are corrected by time factor. Uh, this time factor, T factor, able to increase performance shipping factor values after the working time. In this condition, the influence of external factor is more several to the operators. The combination of human factor and environmental factor returns the human error probability value using equation 9. Uh, a pharmaceutical plant is uh, uh, considered to validate our model, uh, in particular, the uh, human error probability of the decision makers in a control room is analyzed during a fire scenario. Um, the choice of uh, four generic tasks were carried out or, uh, through interview with an expert judgment. And uh, we applying uh, human error probability basic equation for each generic task. We obtain human error probability basic values during 24 working hours. Then, according to another expert judgment, uh, performance shipping factor values has been selected. So we obtain the performance shipping factor correlation. And uh, an index value equal to uh, 0 0.192. Then we obtain the performance shipping factor correct by time. Performance shipping factor time value is equal to the above value of at the eight working hour, but is a triple value at the 24 working hour. Applying, applying the proposed hybrid method, uh, human error probabilities and being evaluated, uh, combining external operation condition with external environmental conditions, correct by T factor. The following tables show the obtained value for uh, uh, four generic tasks during the high hazard scenario and figures describe the trend. So, in conclusion, the aim of the present paper is to propose a hybrid method to evaluate uh, um, error human probability, call it logic human reliability. The proposed approach considers all factors that influence the decision and the action of the operator, internal factor, external factor, and time index. However, we find some uh, disadvantage for applying uh, uh, this method that include uh, an overlap in definition on performance shift factor. So, uh, Fusion research I to develop a statics function uh, using uh, multi-decision model, for example, HP or NAP uh, method or fuzzy logic. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Gianpaolo. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm sorry with the problems, but it's the first year we have this conference. So uh, there are some problems linked maybe to the streaming uh, platform and we will solve for the next years for sure. We have a couple of questions from the audience. The first one from Leonardo Leoni, who asks, in case you consult the group of experts, were your findings approved or confirmed by expert judgments? In other words, were the results aligned with the, what the experts expected? 50-50. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the second question is from uh, uh, Marcello Fera, who asks, is considered the learning and forgetting human factor in the HEP model? If not, is this a possible future development of the present yes, model? Yes, yes, it is a, a future development of the present model, yes. Yeah, okay, so you did not consider in the, no. the present, yeah, no. okay. Okay, thank you very much, Jean-Paul, for thank your you. uh, presentation. Okay, Thank now you. Um, bye, bye. bye. Now I think we uh, have a break. Yes, we have uh, the one hour break. We are just in time, uh, thanks to <laughs> Gianpaolo. So uh, we have the long break of the conference and see you in uh, one hour for the remaining uh, presentations and papers. Thank you, see you later.
Okay, good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon for Italians, obviously. Uh, we can restart with the, the presentations of the papers for uh, this second part of the Copperman uh, conference. We have the first presenter from the University of Florence, who is Saverio Ferraro. Saverio is, yeah, I can see Saverio. And uh, Saveri will present a paper uh, with the title Comparison between Transportation Overall Vehicle Effectiveness and Carbon Emission Impact for Last Mile Delivery. So please, Saveri, share your screen. Can you okay. See yeah, yeah. now we can see the screen and uh, we can hear you. Please go on. Okay, so thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm Saverio Ferraro, a PhD student at the University of Florence. And today I have the pleasure to present the work that I've done with my colleagues that is entitled Comparison between Transportation of Air Vehicle Effectiveness and Carbon Emission Impact for Last Mile Delivery. This will be the structure of my presentation. I will start giving a brief introduction about the process and its duality. Then I will talk about the objective and the methodology. I will report on the results. And finally, I will end with conclusion and future development. So starting about the introduction, the work deals with uh, transportation, especially last mile delivery and transportation activities are referred from a dual point of view. From the economic one, it's uh, a vital activities for the commercial trade and economic development, while from the other side, on the, the environmental dimension and sustainability, it is one of the main contributors of uh, environmental emission. So these two main goal and uh, dimension are, uh, in opposite, are opposing because uh, the economic uh, sustainability look at uh, the efficiency and effectiveness maximization, while the environmental one on emission minimization. So more the vehicle is working, more the emission are omitted and, and vice versa. Uh, so for this reason, uh, we stated uh, our research uh, in order to identify uh, an answer to this question that how can the logistic process be optimized and managed in both economic and environmental terms. One solution could be the use of key performance indicator uh, that uh, can deal with uh, both the two dimensions, the economic and uh, the environmental one. Um, if we considering only the, the process, uh, the last mile delivery using uh, road transportation, uh, we have not identified a, a unique uh, indicator for the two dimensions. So for this reason, uh, in order to alight uh, uh, the relevance and the necessity to, be, uh, to build uh, uh, an, uh, a unique uh, indicator, the objective, is to, is to compare economic and environmental indicators, especially the TOVE index and the carbon emission using factor emission models. We have proposed a, a simulation model based on two system scenarios, one for FIFO policy and the second for optimal routing policy. Uh, moving to the methodology, here it's presented a five-step methodology. The first step is the stream mapping. Uh, we have identified the activities related to the last mile delivery uh, that we have uh, divided in in-transit and non-in-transit activities. So the definition, the, um, the definition is based on uh, if the, the vehicle is in operative way or not. And I reported also the, the time and the distribution of uh, the activities uh, for the simulation. Uh, the second step is the waste identification. Uh, we have uh, identified uh, uh, for the transportation process uh, a lot of uh, wastes that are grouped in uh, uh, four domain, administrative availability, operating availability, performance and quality. Administrative availability wastes uh, are related to all the activities uh, that are not performed internal of the organization that uh, can be scheduled maintenance and no scheduled time. Operating availability are instead all the activities that are known in transit uh, inside the organization. Uh, the performance relates uh, to the efficiency of uh, the vehicle and while quality of the efficiency of uh, the service. 
Uh, the first step is the route planning. As mentioned before, uh, we have uh, identified two policy. The first one is the FIFO. So the first customer that place an order is the one that uh, is uh, first to be served. This is a customer centric policy, but uh, it do not optimize uh, uh, the efficiency of uh, the transportation. And for this reason, the second policy is the optimal routing one. Uh, this kind of problem are based on vehicle routing problem that uh, simply identify the optimal routing on a graph based on nodes and arch. Uh, we have proposed an heuristic of this problem where uh, uh, the, the next node to, to be reached starting from the previous one is the nearest to, to the actual position. Um, the first step of the methodology is uh, the, the process that in this case has been simulated on a discrete event simulation and uh, uh, using uh, two state variables, uh, that is uh, the delivery. It's a Boolean uh, variable uh, that uh, when it's stated to, to zero, uh, the non-in-transit non activities are performed while, while uh, when it's stated to one, the uh, in-transit activities are performed. The second state variables relate to the customer, so how many customers has to be served in one day. Uh, the model works uh, when uh, in, in a calendar time, so in a single day, and there are done uh, the activities identified uh, that are known in transit, so it starts the delivery when uh, that, that, that activities are, uh, are finished. And, uh, and so starts the process, the delivery process, till uh, a specific time that has, has been fixed, that is time finish uh, delivery. At the end of the day, the, the non-in-transit activities are performed. Uh, we have done a simulation uh, using of 10 rounds of simulation and analyze uh, two variables that are the vehicle speed and the max distance of the customer from the distribution centers both of the two variables on uh, three levels. The, um, the last step of the methodology is the measurement of the KPI. So from uh, the, the efficiency performance, we have identified the, the TOVE, Transportation of Vehicle Vehicle Effectiveness, uh, that is based on uh, OE indicator uh, and related to the waste is uh, uh, proposed and, and identified uh, uh, in the, the third step before. Uh, the second KPI is, in this case, the kilogram of uh, CO2, and uh, we have used a uh, factor emission model based on uh, the distance of the distribution. So, uh, talking about the results, uh, here I presented uh, the FIFO policy, so first in, first out policy. On the left, uh, we see the results of uh, TOVE. And we can see that uh, uh, more that uh, the, the speed values are high and more the top increase. This is because uh, uh, the quality uh, reach a higher level because more customer can be reached. Uh, while talking uh, instead of uh, the carbon emission, it's dependent on uh, the, the distance. And uh, uh, so more near it's uh, the, the max distance of customer from the distribution center and less the carbon emission are, are emitted. Talking instead of uh, the, the second policy, the optimal routing, uh, this is enhances in, uh, both the service level and the environmental impact. In fact, it performed better uh, for uh, the optimization of uh, the routing. And uh, for this reason, the quality index uh, uh, of the TOVE increase. But uh, from the other side, uh, the operating capability of uh, the, the TOVE uh, could decrease uh, uh, for the reason why that more the customers are reached uh, and more is uh, the uh, possibility and probability to access the time to serve the customers. So for this reason, operating availability decrease. And uh, in the same uh, uh, way of before, uh, the carbon emission uh, uh, works better when the, the vehicle speed is it's, uh, it's higher and the distance from the distribution center is lower. Uh, so, uh, talking about the conclusion, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this work we have proposed a, a comparison of uh, these two dimensions, economic and environmental, for a specific process that is the last mile delivery. Uh, we have identified that uh, the two uh, indicators, TOVE and carbon emission, are opposing and uh, that the routing optimization works better instead of the FIFO policy. 
Um, uh, talking about the future developments uh, uh, referring to the comparison of these two dimensions, uh, it could be uh, interesting uh, to develop uh, and use uh, more complex models for the environmental impact uh, uh, that can uh, be more case specific uh, and less general, but more accurate, uh, like uh, uh, macro emission models or micro emission models. And another interesting uh, uh, future development could be the one or considering uh, instead of uh, one, uh, one vehicle, a fleet uh, of vehicle and its management, uh, both in uh, the planning of the route uh, and also in uh, the operative way. And so that's all and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Saverio, for your presentation. We have a question from the audience from uh, Maria Turino. Yes. Why has the TOV indicator been chosen? Okay, so thank you for the question. And so we we basically um, look at the OE based indicator that uh, for the transportation process. In literature, there are uh, some variants. Uh, uh, but we have seen that the TOVE is the best one uh, uh, for uh, the reason why that identify the in-transit activities uh, and non-in-transit activities. The other performance indicators are more based on uh, the, the only on the in-transit activities and for this reason uh, all the other activities are not selected. So for, for this reason uh, the, the TOVE indicator was chosen. Okay, thank you, Saverio. I think there are no other questions from the audience. Uh, one question uh, from me, uh, just a curiosity. Yes. What waste uh, has been considered in the simulation? Waste, you mean? Uh? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, uh, most of the of the assumption has been done for the waste, has been done for the topic calculation that are based on, on the waste, waste identification. Uh, one is uh, the time where the process is delivered and for this reason the operating availability can be fixed because uh, more uh, the time needed to, to the transportation process and more the operating availability can reach. Um, we have uh, omitted some, uh, um, some wastes, uh, uh, especially for the performance uh, in order to identify from the strategic point of view the same performance of the same vehicle that work in the same condition and that uh, for the quality uh, all the demand is met and there are no product defects so for the quality index uh, the only driver is the clients that can be served in the the time for the delivery for the last mile delivery okay okay thank you very much Saverio. okay uh, i think there are no more questions from the audience okay so we can pass to the next presenter thanks Saverio. Uh, the next presenter is lorenzo polverino from the university of campania Hello, hi lorenzo. everyone to see you. lorenzo will present a, a paper entitled uh, machine learning's key performance indicators a systematic literature review please lorenzo share your screen yes Just one moment. Yeah. I don't see the the window. We, okay. we cannot see your screen now. You should look at the screen with the plus on the uh, lower part of your screen yes 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 but i don't see the the option uh for you can also for share your entire screen yes Okay. No, we cannot. No. Okay. Now, 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 yes, now, yes, now, yes. Okay. okay. Please be, go in full screen mode. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Please go. On. Okay. Thank you. 
Hi everyone, I'm uh, Lorenzo Polverino. Uh, today I present this uh, study uh, together with uh, my colleagues of uh, University of Campania, Luigi Van Vitelli, and University of uh, Study of Salerno uh, about key performance indicators for prognostics and health management of mechanical system and uh, equipment. So uh, about the, the uh, objective of this study, we can see that this, stu this study aims at uh, conducing a systematic literature review uh, on most commonly used machine learning PI in the field of prognostics and health management of mechanical systems. Um, about the, the, the summary, uh, we have uh, an introduction of uh, the uh, Industry 4.0 and uh, Internet of Things uh, sensor. Uh, to uh, go to the KPIs uh, in the field of, P of PHM. Then we have uh, the methodology and the research uh, question of the study. Uh, later, the discussion of the, resu the, the results uh, of the study and then the uh, conclusions. So uh, we can start with uh, this slide. Uh, we can see that uh, uh, we are now uh, in uh, the industry uh, four point, so called the industry four point zero. Uh, that uh, we can say that uh, renew the concept of uh, uh, maintenance. So uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, news about uh, this uh, industry four point zero, uh, just like uh, Internet of Things uh, um, sensors. Uh, that uh, are installed on machinery uh, to uh, catch uh, a lot of uh, data uh, of these uh, machines. Uh, and thanks to uh, machine, learnings, uh, machine learning techniques, uh, we, uh, can, uh, we are able to uh, have uh, um, uh, several uh, um, uh, variation of, about uh, um this uh, um industry but uh, uh then uh, um we can say that uh, um phm prognostics and net management uh, is um a, a, a news about uh, this industry uh, 4.0 it is a predictive maintenance uh, strategy based on condition monitoring through uh, iot sensors and uh, the main activity of this uh, PHM is uh, uh, the rule, uh, the remaining use of life that we can say that is uh, uh, time length from, is defined as a time length from the current time to the end of the useful uh, life. Um, rule is based on data driven techniques uh, um, through uh, machine learning um, techniques. In fact, uh, uh, machine learning algorithms uh, uh, extracting for information from sensors data installed on the monitored equipment. Uh, we have uh, convection, conventional techniques uh, like uh, artificial neural networks, uh, um, super vector machine, etc. Curious neural, uh, neural network, etc. And, uh, and other uh, techniques like uh, deep learning uh, uh, and uh, trusted uh, learning. So um, everything that I said goes to the key performance indicator because we have uh, um, determine we have to determine the performance of machine learning algorithms and the associated uh, methodology. So uh, the research question uh, of this study is: uh, What are the main KPIs for machine learning algorithms adapted in uh, uh, PHM on mechanical systems and uh, equipment? Uh, so we can say that uh, um, uh, the research uh, was done on Scopus uh, uh, database on July uh, 2022, and uh, several keywords related to the concept of PHM and machine learning were searched in the, the title uh, or abstract or keywords like uh, deep learning or uh, predictive maintenance, uh, prognostics, uh, etc. And um, we um, had uh, 570 uh, first uh, result, uh, results. Uh, so um, I decided to, uh, we decided to uh, add the, new, uh, the words of failure and uh, rule to uh, the starting string. So um, we, uh, finally we have 422 uh, results. Uh, then uh, um, uh, we put this inclusion criteria. Uh, so publication year uh, from 2011-2022, final stage publication, English language only and article only. 
so um, that uh, goes to uh, 212 uh, uh, results, uh, results. And, uh, and then uh, so uh, it goes to uh, four, um, 47 uh, results um, after um, title and abstract analysis because uh, um, several uh, studies uh, they are not related to the scope of mechanical systems and uh, equipment. After the full paper uh, analysis, um, we uh, arrived to uh, th um, 32 results because uh, um, they, they uh, did not focus on pronostics, but only on conditioning, uh, condition monitoring. So um, <clears throat> uh, these are the first uh, uh, results of the study. Uh, to the left, we have the journals in which the papers have been uh, published. So, uh, and to the right, uh, how the papers are distributed over the years. Uh, to the left, so the, the 32 uh, papers uh, were published uh, uh, in 22 different journals. Uh, reliability engineering and system safety this is a search with the greatest number of publications. We can see six um, uh, papers. And um, the remaining 53% of the journals, the 17, owns just one paper each. And they are in the middle of other uh, journals, one or two uh, or three publications. Uh, to the right, uh, the 32 selected papers cover in eight period periods, uh, as uh, we can see. And uh, just the last five uh, years uh, account uh, for about 97% uh, of the total papers. Just one paper belongs to 2015 and no papers uh, um, to uh, 2016 and 2017. Uh, other uh, results are about the frequency of data sets, uh, the diagram A, A diagram and mechanical systems B diagram on which the machine learning algorithms have been validated for uh, PHM. So we can see that the 47% of the papers are on uh, NASA CMAPS, uh, so-called the NASA CMAPS dataset, uh, to, um, in fact, uh, NASA to stimulate uh, uh, the research in the field of pronostics uh, made this uh, dataset, this popular dataset that contains uh, simulated data produced by a model-based simulation program, uh, so CMAPS. Um, it became very popular and uh, uh, resulting in a wide use of turbofan engine as a mechanical system for rule uh, prediction, as we can see, uh, 53%. Other two common data sets are about bearings. Uh, these two uh, data set, 13% and 11%. In fact, the presence of bearings as mechanical system in the studies uh, is 20% uh, percent of the analyzed paper. So, um, uh, also, cutting tools are popular as mechanical uh, systems, uh, representing the 9% of the total study, and remaining uh, 18% are uh, about other mechanical systems. We can see that, uh, we can note that also 11% uh, uh, of uh, papers presented data set created specifically for the problem addressed, so own data set, and others data set public data set 18%. <clears throat> So uh, we can see uh, the, finally the, um, about the KPI, there is uh, results about KPIs. Uh, we divide, we can divide uh, uh, KPIs for regression and classification uh, tasks. Uh, so regression uh, have infinite number of output classes and uh, classification finite number of output uh, classes. Uh, we can see that uh, uh, rule prediction uh, is about 28 of 32 papers, so the main uh, papers. Uh, but we have also one paper, rule prediction, about classification. We can say that, that rule prediction is uh, essentially a regression uh, problem for each meter. Um, this is a list of uh, KPIs for regression and for uh, classification. Uh, just two words uh, about uh, uh, scoring function and confusion matrix. Scoring function, KPI for regression, it is one of the most used machine learning KPI for rule regressing prediction. It's been given by PHM 2008 competition specifically for rule pronostics evaluation. So this is a, a little bit different from the first uh, four uh, uh, KPIs that are used in a lot of uh, fields, um, not only in PHM. Scoring function is uh, uh, specifically for uh, rule prognostics evaluation. So this is uh, uh, is formula, as we can see. 
And about the confusion matrix, uh, uh, we can say that it's not a perform uh, performance matrix, uh, if, even if I put in this, uh, in this slide, uh, but uh, it is very uh, popular uh, because uh, it, allows, uh, it allows evaluating the accuracy, accuracy recall, precision, and uh, F1 score, so the other uh, KPIs for uh, classification that we can see. Um, uh, the last uh, uh, results, uh, we can see the frequency of the KPIs in 28 of 32 analyzed people for regression and then for classification. So uh, we can see that RMSE and scoring function uh, are the most used metrics. Uh, so 39% uh, and 31% respectively. And uh, about the classification, uh, we can see that accuracy and recall are the most used metrics. So, uh, about obtained uh, results. Uh, this paper has presented a systematic literature review on the most commonly used uh, um, KPIs for machine learning driving PHM or mechanical system. We can say that 32 papers were retrieved from the Scopus database about classification task uh, for studies. The accuracy recall results most, uh, to be the most used metrics for this type of task. And about regression task, the use of RMSE and scoring fun function is uh, um, predominant. So uh, we can say that uh, this study could be important uh, for uh, uh, the outcomes of, the, of this research for the academic world to better choice the most uh, suitable metrics for PHM problems to validate the machine learning algorithms. Uh, about future work, we can say that this study could be a starting point to extend the research about PHM KPIs going beyond uh, both classic uh, machine learning algorithms and uh, uh, also mechanical system and uh, equipment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lorenzo, for your presentation. We have a couple of questions from the audience. The first one is from Marco Bicchi. Uh, he says, rule prediction can be considered as a regression problem. So could you please give us more indications on how is it considered in the paper presenting uh, classification tasks? Yes, thank you for, for the question. Um, uh, we can say that regression, yes, is a uh, absolutely a regression problem in general. In general, is a regression problem. But, uh, mm, for example, there is one, just one paper in uh, my uh, study uh, mm, where the uh, authors uh, didn't consider the rule uh, of machinery um, time by time, as usual, but uh, they defined the probability that the rule belongs to... Uh, determined uh, finite uh, um, time windows, so time classes. That's why uh, rule prediction uh, is, uh, in that case, uh, a classification problem. Okay, thank you. And Alessandra also asks, what are A1 and A2 in the formula of the scoring function? Are they parameters or constraints? Thank you for, for the question. Yes, they are, uh, they are parameters. Uh, so they are um, arbitrary uh, variables because uh, they, um, uh, controlled, uh, they control the asymmetric uh, preference of the scoring function. That is a, a function uh, um, that is asymmetric around the true time of failure. Uh, so, um, so we, we, in general, in general um, 10 and 13 are used as uh, values so for uh, uh, A1 and A2, respectively, because uh, they are coming out from 2008 PHM uh, ch um, challenge competition. But you can change arbitrarily their uh, value as you prefer uh, to have a different symmetry for uh, your scoring function. OK, thank you, Lorenzo. I thank think you. there are no more questions. So we can pass to the next presentation. Thank you again, Lorenzo. But I think the next presenter is not still with us. Uh, it should be paper 3935 in the Gonnage, but I cannot see her. So we can pass to the next paper. Hope, hopefully we will have him in a few minutes with us. We can pass to the next paper because uh, the next presenter, Anals El Ruzadi, is, is with us instead. Yeah. I can see Anas. Hello, Anas. Uh, hello. Hello, everybody. Um, OK, uh, the presentation of Anas will be sent by video. So we will share yeah. the, the video, and then Anas will uh, answer to our questions. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. 
Hello everybody, hope you are doing well. We are glad to participate to this conference and share our scientific work under the theme Management Accounting Innovations and Business Intelligence, Decision Support and Outcome Benefits. Let's have a quick look to the presentation plan. First, we are going to start with an introduction, then a literature review. Then we are going to discuss our hypothesis. After that, we are going to present our methodology, then our research results and analysis. Finally, we are going to discuss conclusion, limitation, and propose some future research. Contemporary organizations have become increasingly sensitive to management accounting innovations. The importance of these innovations lies in providing managers with essential tools leading to the survival and sustainability of their organizations, particularly for those operating in an environment characterized by fierce competition. Traditionally, management accounting is the primary support for decision making and control in an, or in an organization. As such, it has clear links to and can benefit from applying business intelligence technologies. The literature indicates an exciting research area for accounting researchers. However, a review of the literature in top accounting and information system journals indicates that literature research has focused on this link. That means the link between BI, business intelligence, and management accounting. Although various benefits are expected to arise from BI functions, research and models that determine the effects of BI functions on the decisional and organizational benefits are rare. Thus, case studies illustrating the use and effectiveness of BI and visualization techniques in management accounting would be particularly welcome. Our paper aims to study BI adoption as a management accounting innovation and its impact on organizational performance in the context of the decision environment. As we are studying business intelligence, let's see its definition. Business intelligence as a main term is defined as a group of technologies such as data warehouses, data mining, online analytical processing, decision support systems, balanced scorecard, etc. to enhance work progress and decision-making processes. BI can be valuable by giving exceptional results to improve the decision-making capacities of decision-makers. These tools cover many strategies and advancement and advancement used to accumulate, give admittance, examine data from different sources, and help decision makers afford more viable organizational decisions. There is a lack of knowledge and empirical evidence regarding the extent of the use of BI techniques in management control and their relative effectiveness. BI systems are solutions generally designed to support decision making in an, in an organization. However, the measurement of decision-making support is mainly rare in research around BI systems. That justify our question research, which is how does business intelligence impact organizational performance through decision support? Let's look, uh, let's have a look on BI tools classification. BI tools are divided into three main categories, including analysis, monitoring, and reporting. And that is the main classification within the literature. Other classifications uh, exist. The literature approved another scientific classification for business intelligence, including descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive group. In a more defined review, BI is seen as a system empowering agent approach that has extensive capacities which were gathered into six primary groups. For example, we have analytical and intelligent decision support, optimization 
and recommended model, reasoning, and enhanced decision-making tools, and others. It's good to notice that in our study, we consider the BI as a set of tools. As we are discussing the impact of BI on decision support, let's define these concepts. Decision support stands for elements that helps organizations in decision process. It leads managers to improve firm competitive position by adopting just and accurate decisions in complex decision situation. Decision support benefits are the primary advantages determined across the decision-making process. Furthermore, organizational advantages mean all positive things that stem from the results of decisions. We recognize the, the decision support benefits into three fundamental advantages, which BI functions might influence. BI, uh, better knowledge processing, reduced decision time, and decreased decision costs. In our study, we focused only on better knowledge processing and reducing decision time. These are known as the most popular adv advantages. We can note that different other advantages exist to such more excellent reliability and better communication and coordination. After drilling down uh, the literature, we uh, have considered the following uh, model. On the first side, we have business intelligence. On the middle, this is, uh, decision support. On the other hand, organizational benefits. We raise two uh, principal hypotheses. The first one, BI functions positively affect decision support in better knowledge processing. And the second one, BI functions positively affect decision support in reduced decision time. We have a third one, which is better knowledge processing and reduced decision time positively affect organizational performance in practical decisions. But in order to simplify, we prefer to focus only on the first and second hypothesis that concern better knowledge processing and reduced decision time. And that suppose that BI functions positively affects them. Now, let's take a look on our methodology. This study is based on a qualitative descriptive approach. Some structured interviews were directed on a Moroccan firm to gather information regarding business intelligence. The exploration target was a Moroccan bank that carried out and used an updated BI framework for more than a year. The outcomes from the meeting were analyzed and the arising topics were examined. Here, we have gathered all interview questions and arising topics. For example, regarding questions, we have, does your company use business intelligence tools? Does the business intelligence tools help in better knowledge processing? Do you have skilled employees to manage these systems? And concerning arising topics, we have recognition of BI users within the company, availability of skilled employees to manage BI outputs, and of course, BI positively affects decision support in better knowledge processing, the same thing regarding decision time. And finally, perception of the continuation of the use of BI systems. Now, let's take a look to the results. Here, we have gathered all responses in form of graphical representation. The first one, figure A, represents the number of responses of managers on various aspects of BI systems. Almost all managers confirm arising topics. For example, four managers out of five confirm that BI affects decision support in better knowledge processing. And it's the same thing regarding the reduced decision time. Figure B confirmed the same thing. Through those elements, we can say that BI systems facilitates decision-making for managers by giving quality 
opportune and precise information. The information produced informs about the past, present and future occasions and permits end user to go with informed choices. As discussed above, BI tools improve knowledge of data and the capability of knowledge processing. Also, they lead to reduce decision time as they enable the business chiefs to pursue choices rapidly and with a high degree of certainty. Among all those elements, we can say that the study confirms that BI positively affects organizations, particularly through decision supports. Both hypotheses were confirmed, and these findings are similar to the literature. Otherwise, like every study, this one has some limitations. First, we focused on a predetermined number of advantages of decision support. Although these are known as the most popular advantages, different ones such as more excellent reliability and better communication and coordination could likewise be truth in future research. Second, there are possible ways to detail BI tools instead of taking it as a set. This may affect the results if we want to focus on the impact of each item within BI tools. That's why future research could take detailed approach to the BI concept rather than taking it as a set. This might present a more valuable knowledge. Third, our survey is based on a qualitative analysis. A quantitative analysis based on a questionnaire may be conducted. Finally, our research is a case study based on one firm. It is recommended as a future research to establish the validity of findings in another context. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attentions. And we invite you to see our paper, which gather all those findings. Okay, thank you, Anas, for your presentation. We have two questions from the audience. The first yeah, one is from Mr. Abate, who asks, in your opinion, why someone, also a manager, is not aware that he is using BI? Is it only a matter of understanding what BI is, or maybe someone can use BI and someone not in the same firm? Yeah, uh, it's a good question, thank you. Um, actually, what we should uh, understand first, uh, in the firm, uh, we have a central uh, entity that uh, manages the, the IT systems. Generally, it's the uh, it's the IT uh, it's the IT department, and uh, which gather uh, let's say a team that manage uh, its uh, uh, this uh, these technologies. And among this uh, this this entity, there are other uh, entities uh, which are business entities like control managers, uh, which use uh, those systems. Uh, Regarding this um, this topic, uh, actually the manager um, was using uh, reporting and analysis for years, but uh, he couldn't uh, he couldn't uh, know uh, and he couldn't uh, uh, let's say uh, understand that there was a, a real BI systems uh, behind uh, all those reporting. Uh, he, he he let's say he um, he thought that. Uh, it was just uh, Excel files uh, and uh, reporting that were, uh, uh, let's say, uh, sent to him uh, as, as, as reportings. But uh, in, in the real case, it was uh, uh, a real uh, and uh, um, a huge BI systems behind uh, all this, uh, all these uh, reportings. And uh, just to uh, just to clarify, all those uh, all those uh, uh, managers. Uh, uh, belong to the same uh, to the same firm. Yeah, to the same firm. Yeah, okay. You were very clear in your answer. Uh, the second question is uh, yeah. about uh, if you intend to, if you are planning to do this interview also to other firms, uh, and is there something you can change in the questions based on the previous experience? This question is from Maria Torino. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first. Uh, Regarding the interview, uh, the next time it will be uh, uh, it will uh, it will be an extent to, to other banks in the in the, in the Moroccan uh, place in the Moroccan uh, market. Uh, 
uh, to gather uh, all uh, all uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, feedbacks from uh, different uh, from different uh, entities okay uh, and uh, regarding questions uh, uh, actually uh, uh, it will not uh, personally it, it will not be a simple interview but uh, i try to do it uh, let's say uh, uh, i i try to do a, a quantitative analysis in order to be uh, uh, more uh, interesting and uh, in order to do a deep analysis regarding questions uh, actually uh, maybe i should uh, take more uh, uh, time to analyze uh, different questions and uh, uh, to try to uh, to find uh, some uh, let's say uh, some more questions if uh, i want to do uh, a qualitative uh, research Okay, thank you, Anas. You were very clear in your answers. Thank you very much, and uh, I want to thank you uh, for this great uh, conference. Uh, uh, You're it's uh, glad to, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can pass now to the next presenter. We are still waiting for uh, Hindel Gonash, so we will anticipate also the next presentation. Uh, we choose from Miss uh, Martini from Brazil. Uh, I think she's does yes i can see her hello yes hello i'm here miss, yeah okay miss martini will present a paper entitled assessment of the social life cycle in the textile industry proposition of indicators for sustainable performance so please miss martini share your screen okay just a moment please yeah Can you see my screen? Yes, right now. Okay, perfect. Uh, please make it in full screen mode. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Oh, maybe there is a problem. Sorry. Yeah, I, I was hearing something uh, in the background, but now I we can hear you. Please uh, go on. Oh, it's okay now? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Okay. Can I to start it? Yeah, please. Okay. Well, my name is uh, Liege Marcini. I'm from Brazil. I'm a student of the Master of Environment Technology. I'm talking about the article, Assessment of the social life cycle in the textile industry, proposition of indicators for sustainable performance. Uh, this article was prepared by me and uh, Sandra Epsen. Sandra is a doctoral student for environmental technology and Liane Kieper. Liane is a teacher and we are from UNISCI, Universidade de Santa Cruz do Sul, Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. Oh, I don't know what's the problem here in my computer because when we put a play. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, because we can see your slide go on yes. alone. With, yeah. And I also hear something uh, in the background. Uh, yes. Maybe. Uh, do you have a PDF presentation? Read. Maybe. Um, let's try again. Okay. It's okay? Yeah, now we can see it. Yeah, but okay, let's try it now. Okay, <laughs> continuous. Okay. Well, in our summary, we have an uh, introduction, material and methods, discussion, conclusion, e and references. Oh, again. No, we have we have a problem. Maybe uh, yeah. I think we also have the video of your presentation. But uh, do you have a PDF file of your presentation? Uh, 
if you want to, to share it, it, maybe if you share the pdf uh it would be better i don't know yes. why powerpoint is doing this just a moment yeah 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 we have a uh, other noise in there oh i don't know <laughs> <laughs> Uh, send the in the PDF. Yeah, but maybe maybe you have something on PowerPoint. Uh, you have an automatic reproduction of the uh, of the audio, so you should you should delete it. But uh, if you have problem, we can send the video. Maybe here. Ah, I know. Try again. Okay, let's try again. <laughs> It's okay. No, uh -uh. no, no. <laughs> okay, don't worry, don't worry. Okay. Uh, please, Sebastiano, send send the video if you can. Uh, okay. Uh... My name is Liege Martini. I'm a student of the master degree in environmental technology. I'm talking about an article with Pedro. Assessment of the social life cycle in the textile industry, proposition of indicators for sustainable performance. This article was prepared by me and Sandra Epson. Sandra is a doctoral student in environmental technology and Leone Keeper. Leone is teacher and we are from the UNISC, Universidade de Santa Cruz do Sul, Rio Grande do Sul. Summary, introduction, material and methods, discussion, conclusion, and references. Science in the preparation of the Corporate Sustainability Report in 1987, sustainable development has been incorporated into government policies and strategies. This document reports consumption in the first world countries and contrasts to extreme poverty in third world countries. The textile industry has a high impact because you use a lot of water and you use a lot of chemicals. Competitiveness in the fashion sector makes companies migrate to countries where legislation is more flexible. The life cycle assessment involves environmental, economic, and social aspects. The objective of this study was to evaluate the use of the methodology, social life cycle assessment, and social indicators in the textile industry. We did a literature review to answer the following questions. Question one, is life cycle assessment social used in the textile industry? How and what results were found? Question two, what indicators are presented in the literature for use in the textile industry? To answer these questions, we follow three steps. Step one, a search was carried out in this corpus database with the following search terms, social indicator, textile and, and social life cycle. Step two, that they were collected within search with all fields and end connector. Neither the search period nor the type of document was defined. Step three, 
the documents found were organized in a specific folder and analyzed in order to answer questions 1 and 2. Discussion. Three points. One, hotspot identification in the clothes industry using social life cycle assessment, opportunities and the challenges of input output modeling. Two, social economic effects in the nightwear sector, a life cycle based approach towards the definition of social indicators. Three, using social life cycle assessment to analyze the contribution of products to the sustainable development goals, a case study in the textile sector. Uh, in the first item, we have with result some critical points were found in the Valley Chain search as child labor, fatal injuries, and wages below two dollars. Two item, the result. Three significant positive impacts are this. Consumer health and safety protection due to the reduction of chemical substance, greater community awareness and responsibility in relation to sustainability related issues and use of new technologies aimed at reducing the to the environment. Uh, three, with result, social risks related to the following SDGs were identified as described here, 3, 7, 8, and 12. Conclusion. Question 1. It was identified that life cycle assessment social has been used in the tissue industry at a slow pace. We can see this through the low number of articles found in the Scopes database from the search terms listed. Question 2. What indicators are presented in the literature for use in the tissue industry? 69 indicators distributed across 12 of the 17 sustainable development goals were identified. Here our references. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Ms. Martini is here. Okay, you can so uh, answer to the question from Alessandra. Uh, who said, as demonstrated by your work, social life cycle assessment has been adopted with a slow pace in the textile industry. Why do you believe there has been no major adoption so far of this methodology in the scientific industry, in the specific industry, sorry? Well, uh, in my opinion, this subject is um, a few uh, talking, few comment. And we have to evolution a lot about the, the, the team. And I don't know exactly, but uh, in our country, the problem is uh, the culture. And the other problem is uh, with the government, with the laws. And uh, we don't have a specific um, compliance about to this. And... Uh, uh, I imagine to years and years and years to evaluate in, in, in this topic. We have a, a, a big waste uh, in, in this industry. Okay, so uh, thank you. The second question, always from Alessandra, is which suggestion would you provide to increase the adoption of the social life cycle assessment methodology in the textile industry? 
Ah, okay. I have a lot of ideas about and um, maybe uh, the change uh, is starting the education, maybe, and after culture and uh, a loss. And we don't have people enough to, to check this point, to check the loss and maybe change the system uh, to necessary... Um, um forgot the word specific but <laughs> when do you have a specific uh, law and uh, people to check this law and uh, it's okay to in implement the social life assessment yeah. and change the conception yeah, yeah yeah okay okay thank you thank you miss martin i think we have no other questions so we can uh, say hello to you and pass to the next presenter. Uh, okay. please. Thank you, the thank opportunity. You. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Uh, the next presenter um, is Isabel Grunwald, and also her paper has been anticipated. Um, she is from the uh, Brazil, and she will present a paper entitled Review of Prior Art in Patents Authored by Brazilian Inventors on life cycle assessment. Okay, please, Miss Grunewald, you can share your screen. Just a moment, please. Yes. Can you confirm, please? Yes, now we can see your screen and okay. we can hear you. Please go on. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. The work that I will present is entitled Review of Prior Art in Patents Authored by Brazilian Inventors on Life Cycle Assessment. But before I begin, allow me to introduce ourselves. I am Isabel Grunewald, doctoral student in the graduate program in Environmental Technology. My getting professors, doctors and research, also authors of this work are Liane Mamon Kipper and Jorge André Ribas Moraes. The graduate program is from the University of Santa Cruz do Sul and is located in the city of the same name, Santa Cruz do Sul, in the state of Rio Grande do Sul, in the south of Brazil. Organizational performance nowadays looks beyond the aspects of profitability of business, pacing through several variables, including the environmental aspect, but not limited to this area. In the sense, sustainability must support economic growth, social development, and environmental protection to create business advantages. In the search for sustainable development, environmental issues become fundamental. A process that, in addition to accelerate industrialization, also tends to mitigate possible harmful effects on sustainability. Since then, process focus on an eco-efficient perspective have been initiated in environmental management system. This study aimed to identify the patent process of Brazilian inventors related to life cycle analysis, based on the understanding the patents can signal the development of innovation, a prior art search was carried out in a patent database with the objective to identify the state of the art. Through an exploratory research, the database of the European Patent Office uh, was determined, whose SpaceNet base provides data on patent process from more than 80 countries, including Brazil. The base uh, we use now can be considered on the most complete in the world, as it contains information on over 130 million patent documents. The search uses the terms life and sequel and assessment. In our search field was filtered by inventors and country Brazil. The search to identify 190 patent process. As you can see in the image, most processes are about methods, composition, usage, and systems. The oldest application was deposited in the Instituto Nacional da Propriedade Industrial in Brazil, authored by an applicant by Celso Savalli Gomes. 
the applicants view the highest number of cases are American company Human Genome Science with 10 process, followed by Fundação Oswaldo Cruz, it's a Brazilian company with eight process. Most of the cases are published in the United States on 101 cases, followed by European Property Office, 37, Canada, 24, and Brazil, 10. Even considering the cases whose entry occurs via World Intellectual Property Office on 109. It is necessary to note that the same technology may be present in more than one country if protection has been requested by its applicant in more than one territory. Looking at the international patent classification is an important tool in patent process because it organizes and facilitates access to technological information contained in documents of patents. Through the identification of the most used classification, we can detect the appointment of quite performance indicators to evaluate the de development of technology in different sectors. The most used classification in this case is considering the APC R2 indicating table. It is also possible to verify in the reference table the total use which indicates how many times each of the classification was used in the 190 identified process patents. The APC separates technology in eight technology groups, which are identified by the letters, letters A to H. We observed in this research that the group with the highest classification intensity in patent process is the letter C, which includes technologies from the chemistry and metallurgy sectors. Next, we have the A classification, where the technologies identified by human needs are classified. As can be seen, the most used classification are tools belonging to the category A61, which uh, describes technology associated with medical or veterinary science writing. It is important to note that it uh, that the each patent process can receive on or more classification according to the scope of its content. The Brazilian inventor with the largest number of processes is identified as Rainer Gans with 11 processes. Next, we have Irina Kerkes with six processes, followed by Paulo Chieta da Silva, Fernando Dota, and Augusto Maria Durvanei, all with four processes each. When we look at the most used classification, we have for Heiner Gans the classification C07K14 and A61K38, both among the most used classification in the total of process of the search performance. Irina Kerkes has in her patent process the classification C12N5 that corresponds in different human, animal, or plant cells, and A61K35, medicinal preparations containing materials or reaction products thereof with undetermined constitution, with greater intensity. Paulo Silva and Fernando Dota process highly more intensity the classification G01N2 nine, investigating or analyzing materials by the use of ultrasonic, sonic, or infrasonic waves, and G01M5, investigating the elasticity of extrusors. Augusto Maria Durvanei have A61K31, which is among the most used classification in the total number of process of the search performance. Subsequently, the classification with greater intensity are C07C45 and C07C49. When we observe the classification with great intensity only among the inventors related with the largest number of processes, we will find the classification C07K14. Looking at the patent process is fundamental for organizational performance management because the use of such information allows mapping technology, evaluate investments, and indicate technological trends. 
throughout the work, we observed that the analysis of the life cycle between and patent process of Brazilian inventors is related to chemical areas, including pharmaceuticals in the area of human needs, with a great tendency in the development of specific technologies. Knowing that there is an academic ten tendency to relate life cycle studies to environmental issues, this hypothesis is not confirmed when evaluating the patent process of Brazilian inventors. Future studies can assess the status of the process, that is an, an in-deep assessment of whether they have been granted, are in force or already in the public domain. Futuremore, expanding the study to other countries based in Brazil, shows an interesting perspective, as it will allow to describe the global situation of sustainable development. Here we have the reference used. Thank you for everyone's attention. Thank you, Ms. Grunewald, for this presentation. Let's see if we have some question. Yeah, I can see a question from uh, Leonardo Leoni, who asks, based on your experience, which is the most important finding of the study and which are its practical, uh, in practical implications? Thank you for your question, uh, Leonardo. I work with patents uh, more than 50 years, uh, 15 years now. Uh, I observed that is not uh, information for use for research or the industry. So we can more, uh, make a more explore for this information. And here in Brazil, né, uh, great development for future technologies. In town. And so we can see uh, if the researchers use this information, we can have more technologies with more results for the development for the country and technologies. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question is from Saverio Ferraro, who asks, for further works, which are the next practical steps that you want to conduct? So the next steps we want to use one for one from these uh, total documents we find and make the uh, analysis from this text and make uh, groups for technology and evaluate what is the technology is vigilant, né? is in real protection, what is in dominion publico and what can use. So make an analysis uh, one to one. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grunewald. Okay, uh, I think we have no further questions. So we can to the next presentation, which is the last one of this first Copperman conference. And uh, it's the presentation we, for this presentation, we don't have the presenter. So we have the video and we will uh, send the video. Uh, the paper is entitled Organizations Post COVID 19 New Management Practices. And it is a paper from uh, uh, Morocco. Okay. Please, Sebastiano, send the video. Dear colleagues, firstly, it's an honor to be able to attend this event, and it's a pleasure to share with you our research, which pays particular attention to a paradox that many organizations face today, with the title, Organizations Post-COVID-19, New Management Practices. But before, let me introduce myself. My name is Hind el -Rolaji. I'm a PhD student at ENCJ of ELGT. With dear Dr. Professor Mr. Ahmed Fathallah Rahmouni, Professor in ENCJ of Tangier, and Mr. Karim Sharaf, Dr. Pro Professor in ISCAE of Casablanca. Before getting into details, I will briefly present the context. In 2019, a virus hit the world starting with China, with Wuhan main trigger city. As the virus spread, leaders and governments set strict measures with the main purpose curb the spread. The measures set had an impact on economic development. Companies had to face several trials, 
during which some managed to overcome, others difficultly survived, and a handful of companies went bankrupt. So, this study aims to get closer to the field by trying to explain these results through a comparative study of two distinct Moroccan companies. Through this presentation, I will first introduce the COVID-19 era with the socio-economic situation. After, I will support the role of digitalization and invoke the stretch goals notion. This concept for who did not know is used in management to designate ambitious objectives. Then, I will display our problematic and our research method to finally discuss results. The COVID-19 pandemic has had major consequences on the world. The impacts of this crisis pushes government to fix strict measures such as confinement, distension, and closing borders. This had pushes organizations to act in a complex and uncertain environment. So, quickly, this is the major changes in the socio-economic world. First, World economic activity contracted by 3.4% in 2020, unlike in 2019 when GDP gross domestic product growth was plus 2.56%. Second, mental health has been impacted by dismissal decisions. The unemployment rate raised from 1.1% in 2019 to 6.5% in 2020 globally. Third, the stock markets were impacted by the fall in oil prices. Gasoline prices in major economies had fallen by less truly 4%. And fourth, for tourism to say, Sector. If we take the case of Morocco, it represents 6% to 10% of its GDP. The Moroccan Ministry of Tourism recorded a 79% drop in tourists in 2020 following travel restrictions. And from now on, the post-COVID universe is qualified as uncertain and faced with these conditions, leaders must make decisions. Digitalization there is several testimonies in favor of digitalization as the digital world spreads, and even more with the crisis. If we take the case of telemedicine, an area at the heart of the health situation, the latter has been able to remedy several obstacles, in particular distance, thus meeting the need for extension and care in the immediate. Indeed, Digitalization is the key element to face the new external world. It is necessary to better be occupied for possible treats because a business intelligence service will prevent treats, an information system with the right indicators to find fault, a management control department with the right tools to manage goals and performance, a telework and security tools to facilitate adaptation to possible crises similar to COVID-19. But faced with these conditions, an, an organization must survive by all means. This pushes her sometimes to pursue seemingly impossible goals, also known as stretch goals. Um, according to Simbe study, in 2011, a goal can't be qualified as stretch without these two criteria. The first one, extremely difficult. This condition consists on very difficult goals, impossible to achieve without remarkable effort. Second one, extremely new. This condition consists on radical changes from the usual working method. This is an example to understand stretch goal notion. Southwest Airline case. So, in 2017, in 2017, Southwest Airlines was a startup serving three destinations in Texas. The company had a difficult period. The vice president must find a miracle solution. So, 
The goal, he said, was to unload and reload passengers in 10 units. Which seems impossible. But with the change of the working method of the crew, and the goal was achieved and the company was saved. Now I will present the problematic. The research question is, faced with, with an uncertain environment, what is the role of digitalization and management control in managing performance? To answer this question, we study the real cases. In the form of hypothesis, two aspects were analyzed. The first one, the demands of the external environment push organizations to use stretch goal. Second one, increased digitalization allow a quick adaptation to a post-COVID world. The objective of our study is to improve our understanding of the legitimacy of the management control function, as well as the role that digitalization can play in a post-COVID world. It aims to contribute to a certain extent to increasing knowledge relating to the concept of management control and tools and, above all, to contribute to the understanding of the interactions that there could be between management control, digitalization, and stretch goals. By using the following keywords, digitalization, stretch goal, performance, complex external environment, we will dem demonstrate that. The company X is a large one, specializing in consulting. The interlocutor have worked within the organization since 2012. It places management at the heart of its business. Management control is, in this context, plays an important role. Knowing that the decision-making process in, is first made following an in-depth study of the market and the environment, both internal and external, while taking into account the various advice from the management control entity. As quoted by the interlocutor, today the world is changing rapidly, and after the COVID, decisions have become difficult because there is less visibility. Thus, performance is based on good advice, the relevance of the recommendations the respect of deadlines, the quality of the rendering, and henceforth, the must use of digitalization. Company X has successfully succeeded to COVID-19 without setting a stretch goal and get into a, into a risk. For Company Y. Company Y is a small business specializing in, to, in finance. The general manager without experts following the movement does decision making within company Y. The practice of management control is based on a purely financial analysis. Digitalization is not at the heart of the company's concerns. The use of a stretch goal was unexpected and inevitable as announced by the speaker. Because of lockdown, the company had no customers and either a plan B to survive. As quoted by the interlocutor, maybe with the use of the digitalization, with a high level of it, and a good management control practices, the company could survive without getting into a bankrupt. We found that, in results, there is a direct link between the notion of performance and the term of COVID. Indeed, according to the interviewees, the management control service provides a link between the top of the hierarchy upstream and decision-making downstream. However, in time of health crisis, rigorous performance monitoring has become crucial. In post-COVID, several changes have taken place, mainly in terms of working methods. Now, it is necessary to perform performance monitoring very often while learning from the experience accumulated at the time of the advent of the health crisis. Also, 
According to the interlocutor of Company X, COVID-19 has favored, favored the use of digitalization. The use of stretch code could be inevitable. In case of poor performance management, company Y not having a digital culture, so its condition worsen. About lack of adaptation to the aggregates of health crisis, it was first to set a stretch call, which led to uh, to bankrupt, given of the difficulty of the goal setting and the lack of managerial practices. However, Company X was able to adapt quickly and effectively thanks to the degree of digitalization that the organization was showing. Moving to the conclusion. For the moment, we have treated the case of two companies having left the same period, but it will be necessary to continue this study by treating a large number of cases in order to have a more concrete percentage to validate our theory. Today's world favors innovation, digitalization, and formation of human researchers. We note through the cases studied that the definition of stretch goals and digitalization is a major element of change in crisis era. A company with sophisticated tools easily adapted to crisis. This avoids the need to fix stretch goals for their survival and vice versa. Thank you for attention. Okay, thank you uh, for your presentation, Hind. Now I can see you. Uh, we are sorry that you could not present uh, live, but we had your video, so you can now uh, participate to the, to the question and answer session. We have two questions from Sebastiano Di Luzzo. The first one uh, say, in your experience, what are the most important theoretical and practical contributions of the study? Um... Uh, in my experience, uh, please could you confirm if I'm audible, by the way? Yeah, 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 we can hear you, we can hear you. Okay, so in my experience, the most important theoretical and practical contributors for of the study is, uh, um, uh, is uh, the one with the stretch goal uh, in, uh, in management. So if, you, if we take, for example, uh, the main idea to the, is uh, to clarify the role of digitalization to improve performance and avoid the fix of stretch goal. So uh, this is uh, this is the main practical ones. So that's mm -hmm. why I give the two uh, example of uh, the two companies because it's uh, uh, the two of the companies are uh, so different in uh, in case of uh, what they came from. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, also the second question is related to the stretch goals. Uh, because Sebastiano asks if you you have shown an interesting qualitative investigation as a future development, are you considering to investigate the topic of stretch goals also in a quantitative way? Um, yeah, sure. Because uh, if we get back to the cases studied in the two cases, responsible of the company uh, X, for example, confirms that they survived thanks to degree of uh, digitalization. So if we take uh, uh, if we take this idea, we could uh, put off uh, and put on our study uh, uh, whatever with many uh, with many companies to get a, quanti a quantitative way. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have no Welcome. further questions. Okay, so thank you, Hin. You were the last presenter of this Copperman uh, conference. So now uh, it's time for announcing the best paper and the best presentation uh, awards. They have been selecting the, selected basing on some criteria. In particular, the best paper has been selected on, on the base of its scientific soundness, the novelty, the contribution to the performance management field and the quality of writing, while the best presentation has been selected thinking to the clarity of exposure, the English level and the organization of the presentation. So I can share my screen to show you uh, who are the winner. Let me share the screen. This one. 
for you should be able to yeah now you should be able to see the screen for the best paper has been won by uh, Joshua Prakash and Wen Yao Yong uh, the title of the paper is discrete event simulation as a remote decision making tool for improving the overall line efficiency i don't think they are still connected because they are from malaysia and in malaysia is uh, late evening right now so um but in case they are connected on linkedin or youtube we will send the certification in the next days for them and also for the best presentation, uh, which has been won by uh, by Anas El Urzadi and Karim Sharaf with the paper "Management Accounting Innovations and Business Intelligence: Organizational Performance and Outcomes Benefits." So, for them, we will send the uh, certifications in the next days. And also for all the presenters, we will send the certification of participation to the Copperman conference. For the attendees who followed the, the uh, conference on LinkedIn or YouTube, they can send us an email at uh, uh, info at copperman.org to receive their certificate of uh, attendance. Lastly, uh, let me remember that I have still the screen shared so I can share directly the page. Let me remember that this conference was related to a special issue edited by the International Journal of Engineering Business Management, which is an open access journal. And uh, for the papers uh, that participated in the conference, we will invite the selected papers to extend um, their research uh, for a possible submission to this special issue. But we also would like to remember that this special issue is open for uh, every researcher. So uh, if someone has a new research that wants to share um, and it is related to uh, the performance management, for sure it would be good to submit to this special issue. Okay, this were the last information uh, I have to give. Now, let me introduce Professor Max Schiraldi for the closer uh, uh, ceremony. Okay, I can see you, Max. Hello. Hello, hello, Mario, and uh, thank you very much. So now we are about to close, uh, and uh, let me share my final comments. I, I think we, we've seen uh, a lot of interesting contributions today. Uh, which uh, certainly triggered a lot of thinking on the topic of performance management, uh, which has been a particularly hot topic for, uh, for a few years. So now that we are closing, uh, I want to first thank the guest speakers, Charlotte Johnson from the University of Lund in Sweden and Richard Keegan from the Dublin Trinity College in the Republic of Ireland who agreed to give their invited speech at the opening of the conference. Then I would like to thank all the contributors who sent in their papers and remind you that, as uh, Mario said, there is the special issues on the International Journal of Engineering and Business Management, for, of course, for the selection of paper that needs to be extended, as Mario said. Then I want to thank the other organizer of the conference, so my colleagues, Filippo De Carlo from the University of Florence, Marcello Fera from the University of Campania, Luigi Van Vitelli, and the rest of the scientific committee who worked hard to make this conference concrete. So Mario Caterino, Alessandra Cantini, Leonardo Leoni, and Sebastiano Di Luozzo. I think that this first edition of the Copperman Conference on Performance Management was a success. We had many people following on the live streaming among all the different social media, so LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. Of course, as always, we can improve on different aspects of the organization, but considering that it was the first edition, we can certainly say that we are satisfied. What I want to emphasize, in fact, is the innovation that we want to experiment in the area of dissemination of research results, because we organized the peer review conference linked to a special issue on international journal, which is indexed, indexed both on Scopus and Web of Science, where the participation was totally free. No author had to pay to submit their paper to the conference, nor did those who presented today. 
So in addition, the dissemination was also free through the live streaming on the social media. So the fact that we were talking about performance management, a topic which is of a great interest to industry as well as research, made us to choose the post, the live, the live streaming also on LinkedIn. But of course, LinkedIn is not a traditional medium of scientific dissemination, but it worked. But this is not the point, of course. The, post, the point is related to the fact that the dissemination of scientific results should be free. I should access to these results be. Of course, the peer review requires time and thus commitment on the part of the organizer. But already all the academics do peer review for free for the most popular journals, uh, where the subscription, on the contrary, are extremely expensive. Instead, today we have shown, certainly on a small scale, that it is possible to take another approach one that makes research results accessible to all without any financial effort. That is why I am especially proud to thank all the people who worked on this organization and made this possible. So please show yourselves some video for the final greetings. Thank you, Filippo, Marcello, Mario, Alessandra, Pop-Up, okay? Leonardo, and Sebastiano. Thank you very much indeed. So on my side, have a good evening, everyone. Enjoy the weekend. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And bye. Bye. See you next year. Bye. Yeah. For sure. Bye. bye. We hope offline. <laughs> yeah. Finger crossed. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.